uh, what are we doing? We are meeting here to talk to a very smart group of individuals that have created a lot of mods uh, for XCOM 2 that uh, has prolonged at least my enjoyment of the game for many, many years. Um, so we thought we would do a quick uh, discussion to talk about what worked this season, what didn't work this season, and uh, give you guys a little bit of insight into the kind of behind the scenes activity that happens when we uh, put these campaigns on. Uh, so to start, what I'm gonna do is just call on uh, each of you guys to do a quick introduction, maybe talk about what uh, mods you're responsible for. And uh, if you didn't make any mods in this campaign, then what kind of your role was in the group uh, for setting up the campaign. So uh, we'll start, we'll just go in like alphabetical order. We'll start with uh, Antares. Oh, we're starting now? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm an, I am Antares, and I'm the one that's responsible for all the bug fixes. Yep. Cool. So basically, to expand on that, Antares would go through um, the Steam Workshop and any type of fixes that were needed. And I think there was probably close to 100. Maybe I'm exaggerating, but I feel like there was about 100 at least, uh, fix mods that were in there. And he compiled all of that for us so we didn't have to scour the workshop for us uh, continuously. So thanks for doing that. Uh, next up, Deadput. Hello, I am Deadput. You might recognize me from mods used in the season, such as the reskins we used this last season, Militia Overhaul Plus, the lovely green Advent Hunters, and Proficiency Class Phalanx. But most importantly, you might know me for the creator of the Golden Danil Helmet. Oh, that is a actually very good credit to have. One of my favorite nice. cosmetics. And I thought you was going to mention Jaco. Yeah, I, me too, I actually. I thought that's where he was going. Puns. I mean, it, it's on the it's screen. Really People know what that is. That's true. Uh, <laughs> next up, Fear. Uh, I'm Fear the Bunnies. Uh, I'm actually fairly new to this group. But I was brought in for uh, the Mach X stuff. I fell in love with it and created the Customizer Plus, which helped with some cosmetic tweaks and other things. And so, yeah, that's what I was here for, is to help with the whole Exalt mess. Yeah, now they were. I think Exalt turned out pretty good. We'll talk a little bit more about them uh, later on, but it's certainly been a pleasure uh, having you join the group. You've been uh, pretty instrumental in, in fixing a couple of things throughout the season, so thanks for that. Uh, Fleet is up next. I, I'm Fleet. I, uh, maintain the, uh, XCOM data bank website if you've, uh, visited that. Um, so I've been doing that. Guess I started that in War of the Chosen, War of the Chosen Season 2. So this is like the sixth one. Yeah, that's sixth crazy. Season I track. Do you have any? Also some... Go ahead, sorry. Oh, I was about to say, also a submitter of Drax, Drac, who uh, after Leviathan and Musin's, I think Musin had a uh, season high uh, EAS in Leviathan. So after that, Drac uh, officially apparently has the lowest EAS of the season. Oof. So yay me. <laughs> From the stats guy himself. That's gotta hurt. He also had the honor of being the last casualty. True. The sealed by a priest. <laughs> We don't talk I'm, about that. We don't talk about that anymore. Best casualty too. <laughs> that was the best best death of the season, to be fair. Yeah, single single best death of the season. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks, man. Uh, Kex. Hi, everybody. I'm Kex. I'm responsible for giving your soldiers fabulous hair and uh, amazing sexualized poses. <laughs> also, I uh, reviewed your Smart. submissions. Very true. I also reviewed just your missions uh, with Nye, who unfortunately won't be able to join us today. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit um, very soon. But the amount of work that goes into reviewing submissions is, like, overwhelming. And, uh, yeah, we really appreciate it because that makes for a pretty epic season when you get good boring. soldiers in there. It's um, fun. It's fun. Next up, Cloista. Hi, oh, you guys. I'm Mr. Cloista. Um, 
you'll be familiar with uh, a fair few of my mods now, I'd imagine. Obviously, I worked with uh, my good buddy Rusty on uh, PEXM, me being the uh, project lead, him being the lead dev. Uh, years worth of work in that. I absolutely love how yep. much I really enjoyed it. Obviously, really enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> anybody who's been using the um, glowy cosmetic uh augments they're all mine uh and uh i'm the guy responsible for mockx being called exalt yes that's true and if you if, but if you do want to you know throw something at me i am also the reason that toaster was so op <laughs> uh i think i was the reason toaster was op okay i'm just kidding yeah uh we'll talk about that soon thanks for taking the bullet on that one uh, Rusty, go ahead. Hi there, uh, my name is Rusty Dios. Um, as Cloyster just mentioned, uh, the second part of the PEXM uh, team. Uh, absolutely love that mod. Um, I really hope that a lot of people enjoy it. Uh, also uh, brought things um, like the unit flag extended, uh, some of the UI tweaks and kill counter that was used in this season. And uh, for the first time, uh, my first ever enemy mod, the Paladin Shield Bursters, which I think were a good success. Um, very um, good success, by the way. I really enjoyed okay. running into them. Also hated them, but you know, like, that's... It has to that be both good. of those things. That's um, the yeah, point, surely. Uh, you know, um, do my best to uh, keep everything ticking over and working, and squishing any bugs that we came across as fast as possible. Yeah, very cool. And last, but definitely not least, of the people who could join here, uh, Wolfson. Um, hi, I'm Wolfson, and uh, I am the other half of the stats team. I've been uh, tracking at least some stats since actually kind of back in the vanilla days. And uh, this season, I uh, got to write some actual stat updates to get read every few episodes. And I was the one who uh, did most of the writing on the trivia questions that were introduced. Yeah, and you, you crushed it. You knocked it out of the park. Those were super cool. Yeah. Um, okay, awesome. So now that you know who everybody is, uh, in the bottom right of the screen, I'm going to kind of paste um, the topics that we're discussing as we go through um, the postmortem for this season. And uh, thanks to Kex for kind of creating a document for us to review so we have some uh, structure in what is an other otherwise unstructured group so this will be <laughs> this will be very helpful um so the first thing to to talk about are just some of the small quality of life uh or or kind of nice to haves that we implemented this season so uh as a review we added uh trivia at the start of every episode we had uh sound effects for uh the bio and log reads of the initial starting group we didn't do it for the whole season um the introduction of stats and the stats updates every week, um, but just also, I think, incorporating talking about stats a little bit more with um, viewers. I think that was enjoyable. We had the uh, roster splash screen, which was uh, Kex's idea. And um, we had the links and kind of talked about these a little bit more, but like the data bank and the Excel file that you guys um, manage. So I think we're all in agreement that these were good things to have. Uh, I'll just pose a question to the group. Is there anything you think of this that we should adjust for future seasons? I think they're all, they're all great. I mean, I would potentially do more stat updates and less trivia. Yeah. Maybe every two or three episodes for trivia rather than every episode. But aside yeah. from that... Yeah. Trivia was, was a little rough because you run out of topics. Yeah, yeah, and it, feels, it can I mean. potentially feel repetitive. Yeah, yeah, and and honestly, that was the biggest thing right there. I mean, having you know, doing one for pretty much every episode. By the time we're getting out to the seventies, the eighties, yeah, it was a little tricky to find some new stuff. And of course, if it continues on in future seasons, you know, we hit a lot of the really interesting stuff for you know yeah. past seasons. Yeah, yeah, but and also you've got to fact. Go ahead, Rusty. Thank you, Dade. Uh, next season's trivia will probably end up, you know, if we follow that through, it will be mainly a repeat of the questions from this season, but with this season included. 
So it's right. going to be. Yeah. I don't know how we're going to how we can follow that one into a next season. Yeah. So coming right. from, uh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say the biggest uh, one of the biggest things I think will be with trivia next season is trying to make the answer not toaster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, well, coming from my that. perspective, who who shared them all uh, in the videos, it, it's personally to me interesting because I like numbers and I like. Um, I'm a fan of the trivia, but uh, I think early in the campaign, uh, people were pretty well engaged. I'm talking about like the, the viewers and people that would comment on a YouTube video. That definitely fell off as the campaign went on, likely because you, it's more just like one of those things that's interesting to see, but you don't necessarily feel compelled to go and like write an answer every time. Um, I should give a shout out to Spartan Keika who posted uh, a YouTube comment every video of the trivia question to allow people to uh, reply to it. So that was really cool. But I what agree I agree that the trivia was probably just a little too much. I think if we did it every few episodes for something that was kind of uh, unique, that would be cool. I also think if we had more um, uh, like new records that are broken, uh, you know, through 10 missions in a campaign, who's got the best, whatever. That would be, kind of be cool that we could, stuff that we could share um, I think as a nice moving, to have. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. Uh, I think maybe, maybe moving forward with uh, trivia, like a trivia question every five episodes or so. Yeah. And, you know, and it does nicely tie into the uh, football style stats readout. Yeah. Those were amazing. Yeah. Um, I, I personally, I love the stats the stats write-ups like Wilson, you had a, a very particular way of writing them like, like a sports desk anchor. And yeah. they were so perfectly crafted. Like I, I can't take any credit for that. You did all the legwork there. It was really good. I Coming think another, Oh, sorry. Um, Go ahead. Well, one, one quick thing. I, I think an issue with the trivia is that there, I, Definitely saw at least a couple of comments where people didn't even know where the answers came from. So I think because of sticking them after the credits, yeah, uh, yeah. people don't see that or meme of the day stuff. Yeah, I think the way that I laid it out could have been better. Um, trust me, like in editing all of those, it was always a hassle to kind of go back and figure out what question was asked and then put the answer in in the next episode. So it was a little bit weird. I feel like for trivia, what we should do is... Um, just display the question, have like a five second pause, and then the answer kind of fades in. I don't think there's a reason to like delay it. Um, uh, well, yeah, or the, the answer at the end of the episode. Yeah, 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 or, exactly. or, yeah you could have the maybe have the answer like when you when they're flying back to the Avenger after a mission or something. Right, yeah, yeah. Well, or yeah. after the full roster screen. So you have the trivia or question, that, yeah. full roster bio read and yeah. then move into the answer i could definitely see that as opposed to wait until the entire next day's episode yeah yeah no for sure i don't know why i thought that was such a good idea but it wasn't and uh <laughs> we'll definitely fix that next time speaking of the I, roster I, splash screen uh we've done this for two seasons now right yeah two, six two, seasons. Two, three, three. So how do you guys feel about that? I, I personally like it, although it does get a little bit messy. I think I know what the suggestion would be to clean it up, but I'd be I, I also on other thoughts. really like the yeah, roster screen. Um, I quite like the ghost effect. Yeah. Sadly, it's parted. Um, the other thing that did kind of get me... Um... You've cut out, Rusty. I'm not sure if it was noticed or if it was... Uh, no, you cut out. I uh, you got you cut out. Fourteen got ten. Oh, oh yeah, I was yeah. gonna bring that up. That's he was really never cool. in the roster screen, even in the final episode. Are you sure? Yeah, yep. I've forgotten. McCain made it, this. but fourteen got ten didn't. I remember That's somebody it. saying something <laughs> like that. I thought I looked it up. I'm gonna. I can check while we get into other discussions. But, oh. um, <laughs> yeah, poor guy, because he was actually he was crushing. He deserved to be there. I mean, he, he was a to be there. Yeah. I, I have a feeling that his creator will probably see the lighter side of the fact that you forgot him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 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 but yeah. Tish. Um, yeah. what do you do? You guys think that it's too messy? Like that's the only thing that I I think is you know at a gl it's it doesn't have that glance value once it gets a little busier Popular. in there. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I, how would you tidy it up though? I mean, the only thing I can kind of think of is some kind of unique XCOM ID cards kind of shuffling in. I think the original idea when Kex brought it forward, um, another streamer, forgive me, I don't remember his name, but another streamer does a thing where it's um, a bunch of squares and the squares are then, um, you know, everybody has their own square. My challenge with that is that you'd have to like reconfigure that a lot as the roster grows. Um, so I kind of liked this kind of this like school class uh, layout, you know, where everyone's standing on the bleachers. It yeah. definitely also makes a really nice, uh, like, it makes, it makes a really nice uh, thumbnail. Yeah, like a group photo. Yeah, exactly. I think I think it looks cool in that regard. Yeah, this is the family that we've gathered around this season. Like, yeah. All crunching in and getting a shot. I um, think moving forward, yeah. I mean, I, I think the idea is, is, is awesome. And, and I think that the execution for these two seasons, personally, I love it. I, I think it's awesome. I, yeah. I love the, the, the bleacher sense. Yeah. But moving forward, yeah, we can definitely toy around with maybe different layouts, different color values or different whatever to yeah. see if we can help the make the soldiers stand out a little bit more. But uh, yeah, that was definitely a, a huge success. Okay. One question about this season, actually. Did you add a moving background to the roster screen? Because I swear sometimes I saw it move. Uh, yeah, it would move. It's very subtle, though. But yeah, okay. it does. Yeah. <laughs> That's finally you're not, you're not insane. <laughs> yeah, no, you're not insane. It was there. Yeah, it's not the shrewd. You be, you be on it, I think you can uh, note it. <laughs> yeah, most people wouldn't. It was very subtle. Yeah, just odd, subtly hypnotizing the whole fan base. Exactly, um, yeah. But, but yeah, I, um, I really like the way that this was set up. I think it was great, and that while it did get kind of busy towards the end of seasons, I still think it worked out really well, that especially since it just slowly builds up over the course of a season, you yeah. kind of get used to who is where and then picking out the new people as they show up. That's true, yeah. yeah. All yeah, good, all good feedback. That. All good feedback, guys. I think, yeah. I think those are all things that can be... Uh, addressed and cleaned up for next season for sure yeah i definitely think like one last thing if, uh, to take away from it if you consider last season's uh, roster screen where out of pure chance it ended up being everyone on the right hand side were dying <laughs> yeah. you know there's definitely possibility for patterns like that to emerge what do you mean chance i meticulously uh <laughs> craft the storylines and decide who lives and who dies intentionally yeah, you put work into those deaths. Yeah, that's hard to do. <laughs> yeah, there is some interesting stuff that comes from that. But um, yeah, let's move on to some other areas. So uh, character submissions. I think this went really well, um, considering how complex the process is. If you think about this, um, we, have, we have somebody who is submitting a soldier to uh, the campaign. They have to go in, create the soldier, do it correctly. They have to create those different uniforms that we introduced this season, which was make... pretty complex, but worked out really well. Um, yeah. They had to make sure that they had the exact same mod list. There's still some hiccups that we run into there, but I don't know how, we're, how we could ever get past that. Um, I think some of the mission or the submission rules, like you've listed here, could use some tweaks. But um, I think what I'd like to do is maybe just have Kex talk a little bit about what the process is like for him and and me to go through all of these submissions like can you just talk about kind of what that's like from start to finish you see a bin file you load it in what happens next okay so well for starters i i, I want to thank you and Yang for giving me the opportunity to join the review team uh definitely fun uh definitely needed uh <laughs> we had more than 600 submissions which is overwhelming but but it, it, that only speaks to the to the to the to the to the engagement that the viewers want to have, right? Yeah. And uh, and I think that's important because people definitely connect with the soldiers. So the process that we go through is yeah, the, the people post the the bins. I think one of the home runs that we had this season, introducing Iridar's appearance manager potentially introduced a lot of complexity. Yeah. And potentially. Yeah. Yeah. And but the the tutorial video that you you oh, released. Yeah was a home run i think you explained it to a t and i think that the vast majority of submissions uh did an excellent job in in following the instructions and submitting uh funnily enough like a lot of the the the, the rejections were 
like your 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 usual suspects, right? Like um, they either forgot to to include the actual soldier in the bin, or they customized the wraith armor instead of the warden armor, um, or sometimes few, but sometimes you know questionable uh, uh, bio um, topics uh, yeah. content. Yeah. Regards to yeah, you say. <laughs> yeah, but uh, and yeah. and obviously and and yeah, another one unfortunately is either egregious clipping or egregious gaps in terms of cosmetics. So what we did was for, I think, a little bit over a week, actually, a lot of us over at the mod team list, we, we made a curated cosmetics list. Like, we, like for a week, we literally tested every single cosmetic and tested it with everything else to see just how friendly and modular and, and compatible a mod would be with other stuff. Like, so does this arm work with that torso? Does this... Deco work with that, those legs, blah, yeah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's so many yeah. arguments. We, we went through about 100 mods as well from the Right. Way. And so the, the criteria for that is similar, was very similar to the criteria for accepting the submissions, which is obviously uh, no clipping, no gaps. We want to, the, the, bi the, the biographies to follow the rules. Uh, and outside of that, honestly, anything goes. We yeah. definitely want to. I believe that the, the, the rules and in general, the entire process is set as it is to encourage uh, new faces, new stories, fresh takes, new characters. Like, who is this person? Where do they come from? There's like everybody starts at that common denominator, right? Like, yeah. okay, I was this person before the invasion and now I'm this person after the invasion. Yeah. But outside of that, there's so many interesting variables. And, and, and we saw that that creativity. Um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, and, it's, and it was amazing and a lot of fun. So definitely, I, I would suggest to to submitters in the future, uh, obviously adhere to the rules, follow the the awesome tutorial, um, so that you don't you don't make mistakes submitting. And in terms of the, of the of the biography, yeah, I mean keep it keep it creative, but avoid the the badass Mac chest hair of you know I I, I single handedly strangled a berserker while smoking, right? It's like dude, yeah. no. We yeah, and I mean, I, I think, like, the, the point that you're making there is, like, it's not that those stories aren't good, it's just that there's a lot of them, a lot of similarities. Yeah, so yeah. when you want to stand out, it's challenging, but, you know, um, if, if you come up with an original idea, it's much more likely to go further. The one that comes to mind, and I'm going to put you on the spot in a second, Keck, so maybe start thinking about some of your more favorite submissions, but um, mm -hmm. the one that comes to mind was, like, uh, Chasu Takeout Bow. Right, and he's got that bag, and he talks about how like he's doing some type of like a delivery or something of food, if I remember correctly. And yes. when you tie in like part of the story, even if it's something kind of silly, you tie in a part of the story to a, a look of your character. Obvious ones are like, I was in a fire, I got a a sword cut on my eye. Um, you know, all of those are are pretty natural tie-ins. But when you have something really creative like that. Um, it stands out, you know, and then the, the, the guys that are reading 600 biographies are like, oh, this guy's got to be in for sure, you know? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Actually, uh, Chasu was my actual very first uh, soldier review. Oh, okay. Uh, and I'm so glad he made it in. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and you're a hundred percent correct. Uh, when I was reading that bio, it's not that it was serious or dark or yeah. overly funny or overly ridiculous or a yeah. joke submission it was that it was genuinely creative and yeah. original it's like literally the story of you know wrong guy or at the wrong place at the wrong time and uh for those of you that were lucky enough to follow through the logs the story of chazu it's hilarious it's yeah. hilarious like when when we were introduced to exalt uh, one of his logs because he didn't want to be with XCOM. he was like Dude, i'm just a civilian Take, get me out of here yeah uh, when we met Exalt, he, his log was actually like a, a job application for yeah. Exalt. It was yeah. hilarious. Um, standouts, definitely there was one that I remember that I unfortunately didn't make it in, but I really loved because of how they tied in the progression visually with the armors. Yes. And this was a, yes, and I love that as well, just as much as you do. This was a soldier who was pre-invasion, uh, afflicted with some sort of uh, degenerative illness. I forget what it was. Um, and I don't remember if it was like Earth disease or it was caused by aliens. But as as it as it progressed, the the bio started mentioning stuff like I'm having difficulty breathing, uh, I'm losing hair, yeah. I'm I'm yeah. weaker. And the progression that you saw in the soldier was then wearing a face mask yeah. and then 
the, the last the 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 warden armor tier was completely bald. Yeah, and stuff like yeah. that was amazing. There was another one. I think Curietti, you actually got him. Yeah, like, he was really, in there. Yeah. Georgios. Yeah, he was like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he was like um, a, a, a prolific piano player as a child, and then he got into an accident, lost his eyesight, but mm -hmm. the uh, auditory, like his auditory auditory system, <laughs> he could hear and kind of like like kind of like Daredevil, you know, kind of like see the enemies yeah. uh, through through like echolocation, and I thought that was very creative. So. Things like that definitely stand out yeah. and uh, definitely help uh, give you that leg up in terms of making it. Uh, to One of the most pleasant surprises for me was the creativity people used when upgrading armor. Because me, if I was submitting a soldier, I'd be like, I just want my armor to look cooler every time. So I'd pick like the coolest stuff and just make them look cool. But like when people got really creative in the evolution of uh, basic Kevlar to Predator to Warden armor, like, that was such a cool surprise, and a lot of people did that. That was exceptional. Yeah, parents um, yeah, just uh, did a uh, really help with visual storytelling. Oh, it was phenomenal. It was so and I think for next seasons, we can give people access to um, all of the different types of armors. Like, we can include the ruler armors and other stuff. I know it'll be a bit more work for Kex and Ni. But hopefully they uh, are okay. With that. <laughs> no, no, we, like, we, we, we've talked about it, and okay. and I mean, obviously this was my first time doing it. Mm -hmm. But from the, from how the process works, I mean, just checking that the armor there's no gaps, there's no clipping yeah. is really a really fast process. It's just that it it adds up when you're doing 600 submissions. Uh -huh. But honestly, I don't think it would add that much. I mean, obviously I want to talk to Nia about it. Sure. But uh, yeah, I would. Personally, I would 100% not be opposed to extending that to maybe, you know, your spiders, exos, wards, and wraiths. Totally, yeah. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, on the subject, actually, um, what did you guys think of the generic uniforms that Brilliant. I made? You know what? It's one of those things that was so well done that you you yeah. shouldn't notice it. it, it does, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's like uh, the Wraith suit on... Trell, with no feet? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that last episode. It's yeah. like, hey, that's really cool. It's a really yeah. cool appearance. Like, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And definitely a lot better than what could have possibly have been an RNG mess, you know, having yeah. the uniform backups. Definitely. So, and I think most people won't even know what we're referencing exactly, but basically uh, Cloista and Deadput created a set of uniforms that would be applied to characters when they uh, were wearing a piece of armor that wasn't uh, part of their character creation process so that everybody would look cool and normal when wearing a unique piece of gear. Um, yeah. So it just okay. kind of worked in the background and the fact that it wasn't, there were no issues was like, yeah. it means it worked great. Yeah. yeah. I agree. I say I think Aerodile's appearance manager was a hundred percent success. Oh, it was insane. I, I sent um Mark Nada, who is the lead uh programmer for XCOM yeah. two, I sent yeah. him a link to that appearance manager and I was like, This is what XCOM three needs to be like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh yeah, he he was pretty impressed as well. Yeah. So. I'm gonna say is the person responsible for the unrestricted customization redux that does not work with appearance manager yeah I'm kind of excited about that bit but iridar's mod is amazing yeah it's and, uh, to come back to uh, your tutorial video on how to use it iridar himself suggests that tutorial video yeah i mean that's great because well, it took me a long time to understand it myself <laughs> so yeah, one, that's great uh, one last one last thing uh before we jump into the next uh category yeah. Just to, just to end it, but obviously moving forward, it is our goal as the Motless team together with Chris to, just as with the submissions and the rules, we want fresh faces, we want fresh stories, we also yeah. want fresh looks. So that means that season to season, we're not just going to be adding more cosmetics mm -hmm. and more and more and more. Sometimes yeah. that means that some cosmetics that weren't used as much are probably going to be removed from the list and kind of keep it somewhere around because... Correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but I believe that the out of the 330 something total, uh, <laughs> on, I think it was like 110 or something, 120. Yeah. It was a just lot. cosmetic. Yeah. So 
And I, I would personally like to get into a little bit more uh, theming of seasons if possible. And that could be heavily influenced by uh, cosmetics, but that's a topic that we can dive into yeah. another day for sure. Perfect, perfect. Right. But yeah, I think that I think that would be cool. Uh, thanks, Kex. I, we really appreciate all the hard work. And again, like shout out to Ni nee as well, because before Kex came in to help, uh, she do, did this all on her own. And I would I offered to help her so many times, but I think she felt like I would be hindering her progress. So she was just like, no, I'm good. I got it. Uh, and she put a lot of work in there. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the next thing to talk about. So to the actual campaign, a uh, bit of a rocky start. And this is going to lead us into some other topics. So um, some of the uh, permanent dark events that were in place did have a very heavy impact on uh the potential outcome of the campaign and the campaign may not have even gotten to where it was if we didn't make some mid-season tweaks which on one hand is uh one of those things where you can like yes kind of accept victory but on the other hand we're uh, or sorry accept defeat but on the other hand we are in a situation where we put so much time into a season and you kind of feel like if something is so heavily, I don't even, I don't know if unbalanced is the right word, but like there were clearly some issues that we had to kind of address. Um, so it was, it was a bit rough at the start. There were a couple of things that were in our control, a couple of things not in our control. Um, the higher recruit cost really impacted us and we just couldn't make any money. Um, and then there was a, a situation with the Chosen where they were basically spawning like constantly. and it was a really tough situation, obviously. Um, but we found out what that was and we addressed that kind of um, mid-campaign. Are there any other things that you guys want to touch base on here? Because I know we did make a fair number of tweaks. Uh, I would say maybe at two or three different interval points in the season. What did we, what did we over-tune and what did we under-tune? Uh, in uh, any of your I think, opinions, I think uh, diverse alien pods by force level, getting the balance level of that correct throughout an entire campaign is really difficult. I it's totally either swinged, agree. swinged one way too hard in the at uh, the beginning and too easy at the end, or the complete reverse and it's too easy at the beginning, yeah. too difficult at the end, yeah. and quite often end up not being able to get it in a good spot. Yeah. Uh, with the amount of aliens. So you, this, this is the thing with XCOM 2. Is obviously, it's famous for having an inverse difficulty curve. Trying yeah. to flatten that curve yeah. and bring the back end up the, the balance is, is really like, difficult. 100%, well, 100% agree. Yeah. Especially once we start getting to modded enemies. There's yeah. several yeah. that we that okay. it feels obvious that they were not meant to be in modded games where there's bigger pods or like yeah. you know yeah i definitely well, think... I like that mission with the triple sectopod hunter <laughs> for trying to bust out rusty from the van i mean that was, was it only three i, I swear there was like i thought it was more than three. Three. five, five wasn't there? there was at least was five yeah it was like five five it's crazy. It's crazy. i, 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 I just have to have my data bank up Wait. did we even have <laughs> meg weapons i can't remember no no. It was to early and it was like, okay, I'm out of here. Oh, and there was a ruler there. It was the Berserker yeah. Queen. Yeah, yeah, Berserker. It was episode 38. Holy yeah. smokes. 38. The fact that I didn't yeah. have made yeah, weapons in no episode way. 38 is the actual problem. But To be I mean, fair, um, um, into a, uh, there, there were five sectopod hunters. Crazy. <laughs> there, yeah. There's definitely something that I do want to mention that, uh, that I think it's uh, a little bit on us, which is like, and, and this is kind of like why I split the, the, the um, the Grim Horizon into in, into sections because it plays so much into the start to the start of the campaign, which is obviously the goal was um, having the 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 Grim Horizon, the dark events being permanent. It, it's it's just it's it's such it, it changes the way you play the strategic because yeah. now you have to make those decisions between what am I going to let pass, what am I going to try to counter, and what am I going to try to remove. Mm -hmm. We kind of failed to see, or at least it took us a while to notice was what the requirements were to remove uh, dark events. And, yeah. I, and, and the fact that it was like a kernel. Yeah. Like, I mean, you don't get a kernel 
until like episode 50 or something. So yeah. it was like... I was say, uh, the, when was, we did discover that, and it was brought up to Tesla Rage, uh, the mod creator of the Grim Horizon, right? His yeah. initial response was, oh, that's my dev testing settings. That's <laughs> not the default. And yeah. you know, within an hour, he'd uploaded a uh, updated mod with better mm-hmm. um, settings. So that's yeah. one of those tweaks where I feel actually like it's very justified. Like you run into this, it's because it's such a cool idea where you can then remove one of the permanent dark events, um, mm-hmm. but making it impossible to do so until end game, it makes it so that it's it's inconsequential. Like by that point, if you have kernels and you're ready to, to fight, then who cares how many dark events you have? Exactly. So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. that was a necessary. I think, dark events, I think my biggest complaint with it, and, and I think I cut, I, I kind of saw this, I think towards the end of the campaign yeah. with a couple of dark events. I know where you're going. Where removing a dark event is easier than countering it once you get to that point. Exactly. Because countering it is two assaults. Yeah. Removing it is an infiltration, you know, a, a, a covert a, action, a, into covert an action and a single infiltration. So yeah. I think yeah, there are a couple but... times where you like just let a dark event happen and then went and removed it because that was easier. <laughs> on the, on the yeah, flip side, you though, to, you are playing the RNG to... game because you don't know what you're going to be able to remove because it is random. Yeah, right. Exactly. You have to wait for it to roll in and then it's like, ugh. Yeah. Yeah. Because how many times did you just ignore a removed dark event chain because it was the same one over and over again? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I don't I don't know the one you minor issues. There, there are minor issues there, especially after, for example, uh, all the Chosen were dead. Mm-hmm. But the remove chain for the wild event kept coming up. So that's mm-hmm. something I did want to bring up to this group as um, I don't know how addressable that is. This might be a better question for uh, Zymanic, who created Covert Infiltration, um, not so Lone Wolf, who's involved in that as well, or maybe even Tesla Rage uh, for these permanent dark events. But um, specifically to Chosen, there are a lot of dark events that are. Um, you know, related to them being around. And if they're gone, should those dark events just be somehow gone? So that, yes. you know what I mean? On the, on the other side, it does dilute the pool of available dark events to remove. So it kind of is a difficulty modifier in that sense. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's other things kind of happening there, but I definitely think they should because okay. otherwise they're kind of wasted slots there. They're yeah. wasted uh, dark events that could have been something more drastic. Yeah. Um, and I definitely think one way to kind of deal with the dark events is when you look at the dark event pool that the game actually has, yeah. it is really shallow. Sure. There's yeah. 32, I think. I can't remember exactly, but it is a really no- low number. Yeah, and you notice so- that over a really long campaign like this. Yeah, and they come round like again and again and again, yeah. and it's like, oh, that again. So I think one of the ways of dealing with that is to have more dark events. Um, right. Yeah. It's just really simple and straight up. Uh, one of the ways that I play uh, one of my own campaigns is I have a couple of mods from B Star, very good accomplished modder. Uh, a couple of dark I events. I love those mods. Um, they add some really kind of minor things and you don't think about them. It's like sectoids get one uh, one hit point and it's just like, meh. But it takes up a slot. Right. And it comes around and it's like, remove a dark vent. Oh, it's the sectoid. No, not really. I'm waiting because I want my gone to ground gone. I want my black market back. <laughs> yeah. But I heard it. I the worst. <laughs> Whilst it's there and you're getting these missions and it's another psionic storm and all the sectoids have got free he- extra health yep. and it's just like, oh, why did I not get rid of that when I had the chance? Yeah. Those yeah. little decisions. That's the thing that, so we had a lot of um, what I'll say is like, uh, I don't know if overhauls is the right word, but there was just a lot of minor things that stacked up in this campaign. Um yeah. The dark events, the 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 infiltration times versus the rewards that you could get for doing something else. Um, this campaign really demonstrated a lot of like the the trade offs. And I'm not saying that I I made um, the right decisions or the wrong decisions either way. It's just that you had to make decisions, and I actually I like that. Um, but sometimes when the when the decisions are so clear cut, then the argument is well, is that even a decision 
And is that an indicator that that certain decision should be then changed? And what, right. what I'm mentioning yeah. specifically is um, removing dark events being an, a covert action and an infiltration. Is that enough to remove one? Or is, is spending two assault missions to counter a dark event, is that too much? Because like that's it's a lot. There's so many things you have to be doing every month, you know. Yeah, I, these definitely these uh, dark events and the countering and the removal. Uh, you know, I remember the conversations between Zai and Tesla Rage uh, okay. about these as uh, manic. And there's a lot of uh, behind the scenes um, time calculations sure. that have to come into play. Yeah, um, the assault missions are done instantly. Yeah, so it. Mm, it kind of negates the need to figure is the end of the month going to roll before this chain to remove the counter dark event finishes and they all get reset and re-rolled right. and is this chain going to be left in a limbo status mid completion because now it can't be complete because the month's rolled over yeah when you've got assault missions and they're instant chain progresses instantly yeah um, and also for Tesla Rage's uh, removal guy, one of the big tweaks he made on that, from what I remember, is it now waits until after the quote-unquote natural expiration would happen for the dark event before you can even remove it. Yeah, so, so it's guaranteed in there for a bit, part, like three months, Yeah, as I think? part of balancing to yeah. only having the one mission mm -hmm. is you had to suffer it for its natural duration, and now you can... Which I think on, on paper, that sounds really good. And I, th I think that is a, is a pretty decent approach. Uh, him lowering the requirement for uh, rank to remove, I think, was uh, the, the right thing to do. I, th I still think that the, the Covert Infiltration team and, and Tesla have a little bit of tweaking to do. Just in t like the time spent doing certain things. Um, yes. I think scanning um, points of interest is... Yes. Excellent. way too slow and it, yeah. it almost makes it like impossible to do if you're going to be if you want to like i get it's about decisions but it just felt those things could maybe be sped up a bit but i, I understand the reasons as to why they have it that way too so it's it's easy to say hard to actually but implement the conundrum is is that you have to, you have to take into account what's fun to play yeah. what's fun to stream to stream slash watch true too so yeah true yeah so for example, one of the things that happened to me, one of the reactions that I had was, uh, and I'm still, still, uh, I still play vanilla because I'm still trying to wrap my head around how CI works. Okay. And one of the things that I noticed this season was uh, there was a lot of chains. There was a lot of, like, to do anything, to remove yeah. a dark event, to, to, to counter a dark event, yeah. to go after a chosen, to get a scientist, to do this. It's like a chain of three to four missions. So it, what happens is, the pacing kind of drops, but also you're not seeing the reward um, closer. The, the, the carrot is so far away yeah. from you. Yeah. Yeah. It's sometimes, and this is why I, I understand why you sometimes started chains yeah. and then dropped off because it was like, yeah, I just, I'm just not seeing the reward. I don't think it's worth the, the time investment. Yeah. We well, and there's, there's a ton of those, right? Like there, there was a bunch where I was like, well, let's get it started. And I don't know where I'm going to be in 11 days or 15 days from now. So exactly. we'll start it well, and see what happens. Uh, well, I had to laugh because uh, you, you started at the very end of the campaign, uh, <laughs> a, a, a lightning a countering lightning reflexes, and I think like on my data bank that's like uh, remove dark event uh, lightning reflexes three. Oh it's really? The third time he that's started funny. that game, <laughs> and he's been there, completed it. Yeah, um, I was going to ask uh, you one thing, uh, if you were but, counting stats for that. Um, yeah, that's funny. But to go along with what with with uh, uh, what I think Kex it was Kex that said, you know, like we have like uh, an activity chain for say, you know doing a supply raid mission, for example, not the extraction, like an actual supply raid mission. Yep. I think a lot of times you look at those and be like, why would I do that when I just can just go to the black market and buy always an Illyrium, you yeah. know, with Intel instantly. Yeah. 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 I, think, I think there's some interface things and there's some of my own personal uh, um, memory things. But like, 
Right. I wish that the, the chains were a lot more clear, especially for supply raids as to like, okay, this first part I think is like, you know, 22 Intel. And then that's going to unlock something where I can get, you know, alloys or whatever. I wish that part was a little bit uh, clearer to the player. Because yeah, I honestly uh, believe there that... There is a separate screen for that. Uh, event collaborator chain. Uh, say that. Me, oh, that yes. Makes, yes, that's another one. That's the one that always gets me. It shows it's a two-part chain. Yeah. And it shows the first reward as like 15, 20 Intel. You look at it, you're just like, there is no point. Yeah. But when you realize that the second half of that chain is a massive 150 to 200 Intel dump boost, yes. it makes it worthwhile. But there's nothing up front to say, hey, the next mission is one for a huge Intel boost that you really need because you're sat at like 15 Ex Intel. Exactly. Right. Yeah, because the description is like, this is to set up um, neutralizing a, or capturing a dark VIP or something. Yes. But doesn't tell you what the payoff is. It's, yeah, yeah. So that could yeah. be a little bit cleaner, and I think they'll probably they'll probably yeah. implement that. Yeah. If you expose that information, it makes the decision making smarter. You have more information to make that decision. Uh, so speaking of yeah. speaking of Intel, I have a question for you guys. Um, how did you how do you feel about those data pads versus um, like just doing basic research for a data pad for like ten days versus having to do uh, like a covert action into an infiltration assault chain to get, you know, a similar amount of intel. I, don't, uh, is weird I think it depends how long the research is. I mean, yeah. I think the research time gets longer each one you do. Okay. But like no. to begin with, the research is like two days. It's like whatever. Yeah, sure. I think you did so many, it was getting up to be six and seven days. It's kind of like, that's starting to be like real time. I fed my soldiers off of those. That was like... That was how we kept <laughs> alive. Early game, early game, that was very that. worthwhile. Early game, they're very worthwhile to uh, just sell. Yeah, just sell them. Sell them. You need the supplies more than you need the intel. Yeah, and they're worth a ton on the black market. Just I sold them. a handful of them this season, which I yeah. previously had never done. But I, yeah, I see the, the value there too. Well, when, uh, like, bringing up the new game, that's when you want to kind of do one or two so you can boost that expansion. Um, uh, contacts. Yeah. So bringing up the uh, black market yeah. and Intel, uh, I know there's a mod out there for being able to sell stuff for Intel. Would yes, that be something that you would be interested in looking at? Yeah, I think I think being able to sell for Intel, it, I mean, it obviously depends on the, the exact numbers. I would it's use that. It's broken the unbalanced. Yeah, I, like I would sell for Intel all the time. Um, I think... S sell it for the, your soldiers. And the, the Reaper HQ. Yeah, you know, the Reaper HQ I feel like is pretty slow though. Yeah, it is. All like right. your your benefits at the Reaper HQ, you might as well just research a data pad. Or yeah. Uh, oh yeah, your here's one actually. Um, if we talk about HQs, I used to think that the Templar one was the strongest for healing, but I actually think the Skirmisher one uh, is by far the strongest um, headquarters, early game. Early especially game. early game. Yeah, early it's insane. Like it's absolutely yeah. insane because you get it's all that. This it, the fact that it impacts the clearing, I think, is what gets me the most. Um, yeah, yeah. I think counts a mod yeah. for that to change it so that's only actual construction would actually be a, a nice change. But yeah, right. well, the, the clearing is counted they, as construction. The, yeah, internally the game sees clearing as constructing gotcha. an empty room, so yeah. it's technically the same thing. Okay, um, but yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. To, to answer the question about Intel, I think like um, yes, it would be interesting. Fear, I just don't know. Like it all comes, it all comes down to the the balancing, right? Um, it's yeah. not greatly balanced. Yeah, the, the it's not. I use it. Okay. It's not balanced. You can sell the data pad for fifty seven Intel and buy one hundred and nineteen supplies for twenty three. Oh, okay. So you could just have like a uh, yeah. Okay, you're in a cycle of never ending resources. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, then uh, totally not giving that to Ah because then it would completely over pay it, overwhelm the entire season. Yeah, I was gonna say, needless to say, I use it. Yeah, of course. This yeah, of course you do. One of the reasons why you know the odd tweaks mod was invented so that we can use mods like that one <coughs> from True. a fellow prominent modder who attempted a balance at a game that might be slightly off. True, and then we can adjust numbers for a dedicated setup constructed campaign. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to bring it back, so we were we kind of started talking about dynamic aliens by force level. 
and then or diverse aliens by force level then we started talking about uh grim horizon um within here the only other thing i want to touch on i think everyone's in agreement that populated chosen chambers was pretty good uh my mm -hmm. approach with them the first couple were not very good uh Entertainment. But they were fun. It was and they were fun, yeah, but I, I definitely had the wrong approach. And uh, uh, you guys and the viewers that left multiple comments uh, definitely drove me in the right direction. And you could see that in the third chamber. Um, the question with those, did you have fun playing them the way you were playing them? When I was playing them, the first time I was like, okay, this is crazy. And then the second time I was like, I guess I just have to go all in and hope for the best like that was for some reason that was my thought process um and it was fun but also frustrating if that makes sense i was like this seems yeah. like i'm leaving a lot up to chance um but then we, we saw when we took the approach the strategically optimal way it was significantly better uh while still providing some additional challenge so you're really at the mercy of like what enemies are going to spawn there and then that that dictates what you know what the difficulty truly is and i think that's something we haven't really talked about yet but um because of diverse aliens by uh force level and because of the number of enemy mods that we had it was very hard to balance not just the number of enemies because that's one thing but what those enemies are at any point in the campaign becomes a total like well this is either going to be a cakewalk or it's going to be a total landslide in the in the enemy's favor, um, such as like you know remembering which mutons have counterattack and which don't. Yeah, that that was mm -hmm. another. That's another like subtle thing that I, personally b bugs me. But I understand we're using mods from a lot of different people that you know have different beliefs and what their enemies should be, and that's well, that, that's yeah. fine. But well, I well, I think it's like more just like in... how random. Sorry. it is. No, no. I think it's just how random the enemies are well like in leviathan you know what if the two warp ins of faceless were muton Veliss's instead or something? It, exactly when those faceless yeah. showed up i'm like thank you thank god like that is like you know um but that's something that we don't have total control of so the reason i'm bringing up is because to the average person and i see it in the discord literally every episode there's there's people that are um saying, well, how come we're at force level 16 and there's like, there's advanced stun lancers and in my campaign, I've got like 50 muton veluses and I'm like, well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, Pure it's just how it is. Counts. You know yeah, I mean? there's, there's many different configs yeah. when it comes to uh, determining what enemies show up. There's yeah. like, who's a follower, what force level, what encounters lists they could be in, you know, stuff Even like the that. Yeah, and then exactly. so by force level breaks off of those. There's exactly. so many different factors. So that is just, there like, hard to get down. is there mm. potential? Uh, like, would a potential solution be reducing the overall number of enemy mods so that we can more closely control the variables that happen at any given force level? Is that a possible yeah. solution here, or what do we? What do you guys think? I think that you'd run into the issue of then every mission becomes too samey because you know exactly what's coming. Right. Yeah. Which I mean, is always when we add enemy mods in the first place because we've got so used to the the 12, 14 base game enemies. Mm -hmm. it might be slightly off there. The adding new stuff uh, is you know is one of the things that keeps the game fresh. Yeah. So oh, I agree. That's yeah. Definitely. Definitely a careful balance. And like if we take last season, for example, with ABA and uh Bio Division. Yeah, yeah. And compare that to like this season with a ton of muton mods from three different mod offers. Yeah. Um, we can definitely see like, yeah, there's it's a careful path that needs to be constructed to get a balanced enemy roster. So do you think maybe the maybe um Another possible solution is tweaking the force levels at which these enemies show up. Would that kind of... Because there's definitely some enemies that would show up, in my opinion, maybe a bit too early. Some of those really strong mutons were like, whoa. Yeah. Paladin Shieldbusters. 
yeah, yeah the paladin I, shield versus shield yeah. versus mark. We'll get onto them later. Yeah, later. yeah. Um, yeah, with uh, with uh, the enemy counts, and um, if you really want to go deep into it, it's probably something that like uh, Wolf and Fleet would love because it's all stats. Yeah. Uh, the enemy encounter list tables. Um, you can construct them from the game. You can technically export them. Um, okay. And then you can sit there with a spreadsheet and a calculator and be like, hey, so if I have five troopers and uh, one muton and I want the muton to turn up twice, these troopers need to be set at 4.2 and that muton needs to be set at 7.8 and that will balance that out. That's like a now waiting number that you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's purely a waiting number. And then like you go, now what happens if I ha add, an, add a captain in? And then just keep going and until you've gone through your entire enemy roster. Mm -hmm. I say this with very bad flashbacks because I've done it for the mods that I use. Yeah. And about two weeks later, you end up with a carefully balanced tweet list of exactly uh, sweeping throughout the force level. <clears throat> right the problem with this approach is you need to a know those enemies inside out yeah um b you need to know exactly when they're spawning and what they're spawning and the weights they're spawning and the encounters they're spawning in the numbers they're spawning in mission type and Mi the mission, mission type is very important yeah and the, the bear mind, pod composition is a different file entirely and then yeah, yeah and then diverse alien pods by force level is going to throw off everything you've kind of calculated anyway because mm -hmm. it's going to add new stuff on its own rules um and then, and you, then you throw sit reps on top of that and then throw sit reps on top of that and, then and the dark map, events depending. permanent ones and then a dark event <laughs> yeah <laughs> map dependent so it sounds map. pretty easy i don't know why you guys can't just figure this out like it sounds like <laughs> Just well, we'll just ask to Simonic to just flip the switch that makes everything work. Yeah, <laughs> I, um, well, I, I do want to say just for um, viewers watching or or listening here, like these are the kind of discussions that um, that kind of come from when you start asking like one question, and it's like it's not as easy to just kind of tweak a value because there's a lot of other things that a get impacted by that value, but also impact the value itself. So um, yeah. I've always found that kind of interesting from an outsider's perspective. TLDR, uh, balance is hard. Yeah, balance is hard. It took me no a couple true, of months. And I there's no true way to get it perfect. There's none. You're going to get close. Yeah. We'll get there. We'll get there. But I recently yeah. added Frost Legion into my games from uh, Mitsurugi. Yeah. And it threw everything off. I, you know, three months of sorting my uh, uh, encounter list equations out completely out the window because I added a new enemy. Mark. Yeah, man. So that's the thing. This is, um, why, um, this is why, yeah. like, uh, sorry, yeah. enemy packs might be more beneficial to, like, focus on instead of just, like, okay, so ABA and uh, Biodivision are all, may, are all in one package. They all are meant to work with each other, right? Well, it's like this season, there was me so many, like, individual enemy mods just, like, stacked together from different people with yeah. different visions. Yeah. So it's like, maybe just... Yeah, maybe just it just needs to be like uh, under under like one or so banners, so to speak. Yeah, I see what you're well, saying. Because you had like the Team CX balance approach, and then you had like the Ashton Lee balance approach, Sorry. and then it's yeah, just, it's just entirely different. Ashley's mods were fantastic. I, yeah. Yeah. I believe that you just said Team CX balance in one sentence. <laughs> And right. I said it was a straight Shots face, fired. Too. Shots fired. I was going to say, in fairness, he, at least he didn't say Klaus and balanced. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. The only oh, yeah, other that... thing I want to talk about here, because I uh, we have so many other topics we want to cover, but um, yeah. where do you guys where do you guys stand on yellow alert right now? That's the only oh. other thing I want to talk about from this list. I have mixed I'm, feelings about I, it, to be honest. I think everyone I'm does. Actually, I'm, I'm a podless person new. myself. Ain't gonna lie. A what? I love podless. What's podless? So uh, there's another variant on there you that's podless Wat C. And as soon as you engage, every single enemy goes on red alert and actively hunts. So literally, it then turns into everything is coming directly at you and not still wandering like yellow alert. Has. So it's worse it than yellow alert, is what you're saying. Directly to yeah, red alert. A lot worse than yellow, a lot yeah. worse than yellow alert. Here's uh, okay. So so just to clear up maybe the question because I think I maybe left it too open ended here. Yellow alert on means vast majority of the time 
80% of every mission is spent in one place. Once you start fighting, 80% of the rest of that mission is in that same exact spot. It doesn't really allow for a ton of map navigation. Um, and while exciting because it creates a bigger challenge, it becomes a little bit repetitive because it's so much just like constant uh, aggression. Opinion, Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 I'm of the opinion personally. I wouldn't run yellow alert and diverse aliens by force level. No, that's what I was going to get there too. Right. I th One yeah. or the other. Right. You either go for several bigger pods that are actually apart from each other, so you have several multiple small multiple engagements, or you run yellow alert and have one bigger engagement, but that's not going to take a two and a half hour mission for a f in one effectively one firefight. That is another interesting point. Um, yellow alert, well, yellow alert and diverse aliens really makes missions long because in vanilla XCOM, you fight a pod, you move on, you fight another pod, you move on. And I actually feel like, correct me if I'm wrong, but would that not be a total cakewalk now? Like, I feel like that's the scary yeah. part about not having yellow alert is that I feel yeah. like we're, yeah, I don't even know if there would be a challenge. <laughs> I'm sure there would be. That's honestly my thought exactly. With, uh, which I feel, I feel like we could like um, balance that out by like, just having diverse alien by force level increase those pod sizes, right? Mm -hmm. Because like, hey, dealing with three enemies, cakewalk. But what about five or six? I yeah. mean, hypothetically, right? Yeah. Yeah, this is what I mean. Wolfson, what yeah. were you going to say? Um, that, yeah, my thought with Yellow Alert is, especially now that we've done it for a few seasons, um, going back to not having that, wouldn't it just kind of seem boring to be back in the mode of, okay, here's a pod. We take however long we want and we kill it. And then yeah. we walk along and, oh, there's another pod over there that's completely oblivious and, you know, so on. Yeah. I will admit, I use uh, AI to AI activations. Yeah, and we so, used that last season, but not this one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, possibly, yeah. I yeah. used that. Yeah, we the, did. Yeah. I think it's a midway point. We did, James. Uh, Resistant Fighter will be triggering a uh, enemy pod. Yeah. When XCOM was even close to the, uh, them. Exactly. During the uh, uh, resistant uh, Haven assault. I'm really interested for people that watch this or are listening to this. I This is one of those areas I'd love to hear like more feedback on because I think from a viewer's perspective, which is ultimately why... I, you know, I think you guys make mods for other people to use them. And I think I create videos for other people to enjoy them. And I think that combination is like, we're doing this to create a fun, uh, yet challenging experience um, that the viewers will enjoy. And I think there's a, there's, a, there's a handful of viewers that want to see pain and destruction and like, you know, impossible odds and maybe overcoming that. And there's another more, group that's like, I want to see progression. I want to th see things moving forward. And yellow alert maybe hinders that. Um, and in combination with um, covert infiltration being a little bit slower. It's a, it's a different type of campaign. You know what I mean? I think one of the things with yellow alert is uh, trying to take an initial pod down using shots only. Yeah. 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 Um, if, if you go guns blazing or grenades booming. In, yeah. Uh, case that it is yeah and draw everything towards you you do end up with that very static fight yeah uh, in one place you know you need to trench in and take it that was something i did learn over the course of um the last two seasons like that traditional grenade opener it's like it's not as as good anymore which is you know it makes sense um but at the same time i feel like regardless of whether or not you open with a loud bang depending on the map type, depending on a lot of different factors, you're just that next turn of engagement, there's always a new pod coming in, right? And it just kind of felt like that was a little bit samey. So anyways, I guess more to more to talk about this one. Um, but yeah, for sure. it, it's a hard one to get right because you, you do want to keep that balance, but you have to keep in mind um, difficulty. You have to keep in mind uh, enjoyment. You have to keep in mind episode length. Like I have the stats to show, you know, on a two hour episode, um, the average watch time is like 32 minutes, right? So 
So, um, you know, that's, a, that's a bit challenging. The other thing is, do I just, do I start, and we don't need to get into this super, super deep, but do I start editing some stuff like where I'm just like thinking about a, a, a decision for 10 minutes? Do I just kind of edit that out? Like, uh, again, so I know me personally, one of the things that drew me to your channel was the fact that you did talk through every decision you make and you mm -hmm. work through that. Yeah. And I learned a lot by watching your stuff and watching how you tactically approach mm -hmm. the combat. Yeah. I love that stuff. Yeah. yeah, I was about to say, I actually yeah. think I became a better XCOM player myself watching Odd <laughs> talk through all the, and uh, to talk through options, I'd be like, oh, I actually never really thought about it. Oh, we that. have this, we have it on tape, sense. guys. We have it on tape. Fleet said it. <laughs> And uh, can we can we just write that down? I'm gonna. Put, this is gonna go on my wall. Eight well, years uh, yeah, I definitely learned how to play XCOM uh, from watching you. Uh, yeah, well, I, no, I, I appreciate that, but I also think like I can still convey that same um, thought process without having to repeat the same thing seven times in a five minute span, where I'm just unsure, and that could also speed up the the video for people, but. Like I was saying, there's people that really like that, and there's people that are like, "Okay, like I'm, I gotta watch some TikTok, so let's get going," you know. Well, well what yeah. I will say. Up. Oh, sorry, Chloe, Steve, go first. I was gonna say what I will say is, um, if you edit it out a lot of your thought processes, we wouldn't have got that amazing moment when uh, Clarity Panic procked. Oh, true. And your reaction to it. But I would keep that. You know what I mean? Like I, I could control like what we show and stuff but i know that's more of like a personal thing i need to decide on how to improve yeah because i think the, the approach to your missions i think is, is 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 great it's just that that approach happens many times because we added so many toys and so yeah. many enemies so much stuff yeah. that it just inevitably is making the episode length uh longer yeah so maybe, and with yellow alert i'm just like there's i know there's yeah, 15 I, enemies about to run at me so like well i don't know <laughs> you gotta I, definitely, yeah, take I, a guess. I, I, I think the trick is managing it managing either the mod list uh yellow alert i reverse aliens by force love whichever yeah so it doesn't become a war of attrition yeah well yeah and decision paralysis is also a thing of, oh totally you know, so many times with, like, say, the combat engineer, where you had the entire toolbox available, you're like, well, do I do this option? Do I do this option? Do I do this option? Yeah, and decision fire. paralysis can be real. What a good transition into our next topic. Um, <laughs> we're going to be able to say the thing that I was going to say. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, it was just a quick one, and it was something that Zymanic uh, allowed us and zoomed us into, and it's about um, speeding up missions that I think actually work really well. Um, for anyone that is playing currently, enable the console, use the plus and minus keys, speed up and slow down lost turns. That's, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, that, that makes a big difference. And I was doing that in this campaign uh, a couple times towards the, the middle part. Um, but even that, there's so much, like as a player, you know, when you're recording something, it's, it's a much different ball game than when you're just playing it on your own. Because, yeah. yeah, I mean... I think it's a personal thing that I need to figure out where I want to go yeah. with that. But um, okay, so let's get into some of the the classes. Um, the the kitchen appliance in the room is obviously uh, Sparks and uh, Toaster more specifically, and I think we're all in agreement that Sparks were too, proficiency Sparks uh, in current state, the way that we saw them in this campaign, were too strong. Um, but I would say they were fun as hell to play. Like it was an absolute blast using two of the three of them, in my opinion. I, I will say that after watching uh, and being an avid follower for countless years, mm -hmm. this is by far the the season of sparks. I don't think yeah. any other season has seen them actually be used and enjoyed Not. to the level of degree they were this season. So in that respect, sparks were a success. The challenge with Sparks, in my opinion, has always been <laughs> it's the opportunity cost, right? So, like, if, if I have so many amazing soldiers, like, the Sparks have to be as good or better to use them. Well, yeah, and I'm of the personal opinion that the changes that were made to the repair times were a significant player in bringing Sparks to the forefront. So you mix that with then 
the power level of the proficiency spark classes. Yes. And the two of them combined gave us kind of this super soldier effect. That's a fantastic But point. if the repair times hadn't been expanded, even with the power of the proficiency spark class, I don't know if Toaster would have been top tier if he had been out for, you know, 60 days every time. Mm -hmm. So and I'm of the opinion that it, the big reason Sparks got projected forward is because of the speed up to the repair times, which I personally think is a good thing because then that brings them more in line with wound times. So yeah, while Firaxis would let you send them out injured, how many times in pre-proficiency you would spin them out just to have them die? Yeah. And that is a very painful setup of, okay, why do I send out this three health spark? Because he's literally going to die in one hit. At which point you're like, I'm going to bench him. And then 60 days later, you now have kernels. And it's like, why do I even bring it? Yeah. I Although I, I think that in this case, really, the, the power of the sparks changed things quite a bit. Because there were plenty of times where you would bring out Toaster or one of the other sparks while they were damaged. I mean, that happened less later on because Toaster tended not to get damaged. Um but if he was damaged, it, but you felt you needed the power that he brought, you brought him out anyway. You just brought a combat engineer along or a um, tech specialist along to repair it. Yeah, and even yeah. So, <laughs> uh, tech specialists. We'll maybe talk about them a little bit later. But um, <laughs> I think one of the challenges. So toaster. We talk about toaster and the other sparks because, like, you know, that's what it was. Um, for yeah, me, I feel like with toaster, if he takes. All but basically, if he's got any shield or any shields left at the end of the mission, he has no repair times. And so he's essentially got two HP bars, uh, and one is inconsequential mm -hmm. to him being needing repairs. Yeah. And I'm wondering, like, is the better approach to just give him slightly more HP and get rid of these these shields? To... So good thing you bring that up, yeah. because yeah. a lot of the bouncing was around another mod called Shield Rework. Uh, that was and uh, that, Yeah, that switches uh, out I'm the fairly sure ablative. I was running it as well. Oh, yeah, that switches out that ablative shield bar yeah. for armor pits. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so, the, like amount shields, the amount of shields that uh, the Sparks were actually getting from the Ballistic Shields mod was admittedly overlooked by Cloyster, myself, yeah. and Abizzi. Um, we did not realize that it was a 24 hit point shield at the max I tier. Think at least, I think at least part of that was when I was originally doing my testing, spark shields didn't exist. They got yeah. added later on. So my initial testing was based around the normal soldier shield. So it Which sounds like, it sounds like shield, what we're all saying... The values are the same. It sounds like what there we're all saying is that... Consequences. Uh, it sounds like what we're all saying is essentially the sparks themselves were fine. It was some of the other stuff that impacted the sparks that made them seem stronger than they may have been. Right? And I'll give you I'll give you another example. So we talked about repair times. We talked about the the shield uh, mod and how kind of out of control the shields got. But um, and we'll come back to this maybe a bit later. But um, you think of somebody like fourteen got ten our artillery spark. Right, we nerfed artillery sparks mid campaign because they were too strong. They had the unlimited grenades, and we were just lobbing stuff literally across the map, which was awesome. But it was too strong, and we nerfed that. But then we had another class, the the den mother or pool mother class, that when paired with the artillery spark made them just as OP. I would argue as somebody like toaster, right? But it's it's not this. Toaster or the artillery spark 14 got 10, like specifically. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Especially so, when you consider one of the uh, like the balancing points between the artillery spark is a massive amount of upfront damage. Yeah. But you need to take an extra turn to reload. And it's not until the later levels that you but you know, you got into on that last uh, broadcast. I, I wish you'd got to see our over, over, overdrive serial because that is OP. Oh, and but, it's designed I, reading the description, I was like, yeah, I this is broken. It. Pick it. <laughs> I yeah. built it specifically to be OP. Yeah. Because, because you've earned it by that point. A, you've earned it by and, that point. Um, but B, it actually has a native balance because I removed adaptive aim from artillery and pioneer sparks. Yep. 
yes, you've got the auto reload on kill, but you're losing 15 aim every shot. And that stacks three shots. That's more minus 45 aim. You're not hitting anything. Yeah, that's fair. I didn't think about that. Yeah, in, so um, it ends up being about six shots uh, tops that you can end up doing. Once but those six it. shots are probably killing six enemies. Yeah. And you have to be overdrive to do it, right? True. Yeah. 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 You can only do it once every yeah. five turns. I, think, yeah. I definitely think that was a nice balancing factor, especially for the bug out. Mm -hmm. Introducing the free AP cost. So yeah, I mean, right. overdrive. Uh, yeah. Overdrive yeah. Really. And especially leading forward, like there has been, you know, at least one other mod release since, which is my cloister, um, that takes the account of actually having overdrive specific spark skills. Yeah. That's the route for sparks that hasn't really been explored yet. Yeah. Though going back to the keeper, I would like to bring up that the keeper is a great support class because <laughs> When, if you think about the role of a support class, the point of it is that whenever it shows up on the mission with the rest of the squad, the rest of the squad behaves at a higher level. So I think Eridar did an amazing job with the Keeper class in creating a really unique and powerful support class. Because on its own, the Keeper is just an okay overwatch mediocre bot. yeah but no, once you really mix it anchor. in with any you know composition that reload structure is amazing the reposition is amazing and it just shows how i can have a very good universal support slot which is actually in my opinion something that was very lackluster in yeah. traditional xcom yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that, that I think the, the niche of support class had been kind of largely unexplored aside from, you know, you have your medic that heals everybody. Yeah. That, yeah, I thought the Keeper class was fabulous, that it really did add a lot of great stuff in that support role, but I don't think it ever reached the point of being absurdly overpowered or really making anything else too overpowered. I mean, the combo with the artillery spark was was pretty big. But aside from that... Like you said, it boosted the rest of the squad, but I don't think it ever verged on overpowered territory. Because, yeah, you know, even well. with even with base classes or marines or, you know, zone suppression or kill zone, you still have that, yeah, it costs a couple ammo to set it up, but then I just use my keeper to refill them, and suddenly I have a massive kill zone. So even yeah. without the artillery spark, you still have potentially extremely powerful setups yeah. that you could interact with. And but, to be uh, fair, like I, a support class. I think that stuff should be available. Like, I don't think you need. we should be nerfing anything based on the fact that there's some OP combinations because a couple of things. Number one, the Keeper class, at least the way I played it, um, we had one, right? Uh, we couldn't take mm -hmm. her out on every mission. We could have made like additional Keepers if we researched the uh, thing in the Tactics School. Um, I don't know if they're exactly the same or not. I've never. I've I think never they are the same thing. from what I see. Uh, yeah, it's the first same class. Two, okay. First two peripheries are the same. The third XCOM row is. Okay. So. And see, like, I'm more of a fan of uh, when you have a class like that Keeper class. Like, I liked only having one of them. I liked that she became yeah. this kind of uh, hero unit yeah, like, uh, in a sense, I'm where just, if we would have lost her and there was a couple times that were close, that was like really tense because. She did have so much utility, right? And she was kind uh, of how like, much is that? yeah, she was great. You say yeah. about about losing her, it being really tense. How much of that was the fact that it was in the A? Well, I think that was another really cool thing that you guys came up with was to to code Den Mother as Knee, the Pool Mother. Like that was so sick. That was awesome. Um, yeah. But even if, if it, to be fair, if it wasn't her, I personally valued that class so highly that I would have been devastated if we lost it, you know? You'd break yeah. the game in my field support. <laughs> yeah. Well, I look at that as like a faction soldier, right? You lose a, a skirmisher, a Templar, or now, in my opinion, you lose a Reaper. Like, that is significant. Um, and it should feel that way. And that's what one of the things... And really like you could it. actually do something. There's actually a, a covert infiltration chain that's been created that can help you recruit soldiers... And something like the Keeper or uh, like the uh, Jane Kelly starting class could potentially be recruited through that chain 
and then that gives it that faction soldier feel exactly as well. yeah. Yeah, yeah, Tesla's uh, recruit resistance leader. Yeah, yeah. And to be, um, there's also like the uh, fact that you could have trained up like uh, uh, once you promoted a faction soldier up to certain rank, you could promote normal human soldiers into like I think you could do like two at most. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. To to wrap this up, so sparks. Uh, for people watching and listening, like we know they were strong. Uh. And they they are strong uh, based on the, the factors we talked about. Um, if we use, or I should say when we use sparks in future campaigns, um, there will definitely be some changes uh, that will make them a little bit more balanced. I want to just harken back to last season. Um, the overpowered aspect was uh, Pex M, the Psionics X Machina. Yeah. Um, and everybody was like, oh, Psionics too strong. And they were, right? But it was the first iteration um, yeah, and this season, it was much more balanced. So we'll talk about that specifically in a bit. Um, but I just want people to know, like, sometimes that happens. Something comes in, and for multitude of, of reasons and other um, mods impacting things, things look really strong, and we got to do our best to kind of balance that uh, going forward. So that's kind of the, the story with Sparks. Um, I think, I think um, Fear, all of your points about Den Mother are, are, are bang on. And I don't think there's a lot of, like, changes i would recommend for her i i do think her ammo reloading every single turn multiple soldiers is too strong i do feel like that's probably a one turn cooldown skill to really try to finesse um the balance but besides that i don't think she was op um i really think iridar did a great job balancing that yeah for a class that's only got two perk ranks as well yeah. Yeah. No PCP additions. True. No uh, progressive rank up additions. Yeah. Um, and uh, also one singular weapon. You know, one True. of the things that they really touched on. She's one of the few classes that doesn't have a secondary at yeah. all. Yeah. Because we could have easily sigrated her, and uh, she would have then she enters OP status because she could be doing so many things every turn. Uh, well, here's one of the interesting things with Den Mother. Even if you had side graded her, she doesn't have a secondary weapon slot. No, no, that's what I'm saying. If she had that, she would be a, a easy side grade potential. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? So then she becomes yeah, insanely yeah, yeah. strong. Yeah. Um, so I think that she, you know, compared to how um, balanced the PCP pack uh, classes are, uh, the fact that Den Mother holds her own in that class setup yeah is props to Eridor. just for people yeah. watching when he says pcp he's talking about the proficiency class uh setup yeah. so but so basically all the the six classes that we've run the last two seasons for for her to fit in with that is pretty pretty impressive well there's uh, one, then... one thing to be said about classes and that is an entire subset of classes that we never got to see because we were never able to capture a mox unit yeah true. yeah yeah, yeah true. And fear did a great job with those as well yeah it's they too bad yeah, how many yeah, how many uh, attempts subset. did we have three four uh I I you had I actually did. quite a few attempts where you could have just knocked the guy out grabbed them and ran and instead you're like nope dead <laughs> yeah, yeah there were yeah. i think there were two times where you actually went for the capture they were actually the very first and the very last box encounters you actually oh tried only two to i thought there was like at least three yeah i was about to say i think there was only two okay uh, yeah. you guys, you guys right. would know I, I don't know i just play the game um i don't know I think on the, there was on the one exalt. where he tried and then exited the map and it didn't count because they were still unca unconscious when the map ended and he Maybe. thought it was going to do an auto capture and it didn't yeah um I, there was that one attempt, but yeah, no, I actually went in and created a whole bunch of uh, what I called hybrid classes that modeled the original four base classes, yeah. and then just plug and played in all the proficiency stuff and built them out to three trees. And it was going to yeah. be cool if you ever captured yeah. one. Oh, bro, I you know. actually had gremlin heels if you got a specialist. So here, here yeah. just to give you additional yeah. context as to why it was, I mean, okay, so a couple things. Number one, I I felt like. Uh, for whatever reason, th this the system to me felt a little clunky in terms of I had to like move next to them and then I had to knock them out and then I had to extract them. But you had to do this within a very short time frame. And for me, it always it felt like maybe it wasn't correct 
uh, every time. But it always felt like I could do that, but I have a billion other enemies running at me right now. And if I waste a turn on that for a pretty low percentage chance of getting a soldier, I might be losing somebody else. So that was always the, the trade-off for me. And I've, I've always prioritized, uh, rightfully or not, trying to keep soldiers uh, alive instead of putting we, them Which is valid. Yeah. The fake lead-out mechanic that uh, Reality Machina had introduced <laughs> is awkward. Yeah. The check up yep. their ability stuff and you know, even just trying to get that to even work because we were we <laughs> well, were definitely it didn't work at the start of the season. Yeah, yeah well, we were struggle busting at the start of the season just to try to get it working. Mm -hmm. Uh and then yeah, it's kinda awkward of they enter into the stunned state and then so I actually have a few thoughts around that that I want to kind of run by reality and cool. and try to figure out what's going on around that see if we can make it make better it. because that's part of that awkwardness yes is they enter into this weird state through their stun but they auto trigger their evac and yeah. so even to knock them unconscious to try to extract them at the end of the map it just yeah i agree it's just kind of awkward i think one of the things that um uh people brought up was this uh fulton harness mod where you could uh you know you can attach stuff and like just send it out and there are actually a couple of use cases for that this season i think of a couple of sewer missions but um you know if we could do something like that specifically for uh exalt then that would be yeah that well i think cool. you did that in a previous season where you yeah. actually use fulton harnesses for that very purpose yeah, yeah yeah that was the one time you actually did capture a mox it was two seasons ago the first time doing the all-stars um sila hawk i ended up uh, writing for i just her love that you know that she was tragically killed oh that's awesome but yeah that was the one time you did actually get that capture okay. was yeah. with a bolt and harness i do yeah. feel like it, you know um part of the core idea of having mox is being able to capture them and i think I if we can just them. if we can clean that up um, and just make it a, a better, I don't mean easier experience, but just a cleaner way of doing it where I don't have to A, evac one of my soldiers with them, uh, B, worry about them evacing mysteriously. Uh, and if I, maybe I just need to understand the system better, but, uh, then I would go. I, I feel like the system is. The system's a little clunky, well, okay. yeah, because that was part of the reason why we introduced the whole non-lethal combat piece. Exactly. Was to be able to, hey, I've wounded a mock X soldier down, I then send in to stun them using non-lethal combat, yeah. and then knock them out on the next action, when yeah. there is no evac clock running. But you never really kind of got into the vibe of liking yeah. non-lethal combat, yeah. so you never used it. Yeah. Because well, I mean, they still evac because, even you know, if you... They still yeah, evac when you knock them out thing. anyway. That anyway, was the right? challenge for me, yeah. Uh, yeah only if they just... entered into Spec Ops durability. So that was the big thing, is if you shot them and knocked them into stun through that, yeah, it right. triggered the evac. But if you no, used only for combat to knock them into stun and then knock them unconscious, the evac has not auto-triggered yet, so you could extract them at the end of the mission. And I think I, I, that's I just where like the confusion here. came it's, from. It's definitely too many overlayered... Uh, Systems, in but yeah, place. I've definitely yeah, had thoughts might. around that whole extraction mess and ways to try to clean it up and make it a better play yeah. experience. I've definitely, yeah, I mean, I kind of feel like that. when you knock them unconscious, I mean, I don't know how feasible this even is. Like, if you knock them unconscious, then the evac counter, the evac should just get canceled or something. That would be your so one way to do it. It's supposed to, it was a representation of bleed out because. The right. original way it was designed is they actually enter into bleed out. Yeah. For real bleed out. Yeah. And then whenever their bleed out counter hit one, they auto evac. And, what and I that swear that worked in earlier region. seasons that we've used them. But yeah. It was it actually was, uh, enemy uh, AI. Okay. Enemy oh. AI couldn't really play nice. Uh, so. So, yeah. Yeah. so a couple of creative workarounds and here we are, basically. Yeah, but I'm curious what you felt about them in terms of facing them as an enemy uh, a lot of people are saying they're morons they didn't do anything other people say yeah they killed rusty uh, <laughs> well, like, what do you feel like they, they they ignored for example yellow alert uh defense mode actions mm -hmm. like what, what's your 
take on them as as enemies. So I actually okay. So originally when we were starting the season, I was like, we got to figure out this yellow alert thing because these guys are gonna come in and just murk our entire squad every time. Uh, and I, as the campaign went on, I actually kind of liked that additional threat that they provided, where they didn't play by those same rules and they could come in as a reinforcement and take immediate actions. Like I thought that was um, made them a little bit more um, stand out ish, if that makes sense. Um, well, but there were specific mox enemies that I dreaded. The snipers with the AP rounds, like they could all, they could one shot our dudes, and that was very scary. Uh, when they had like the the Templar versions, I was like, that's a problem. That's an issue. Um, the skirmishers, I felt if they would have relied more on uh, pulling our units with their grappling hook, that would have been a huge problem. Um, yeah, you got lucky with skirmishers. Uh, when I played yeah. mock X skirmishers, they are a nightmare. Yeah, they grapple, yeah, yeah they're my first play for um, target. Condition. Some of the um the the psyops that could do guaranteed. I hate guaranteed damage unless I'm the one doing it, obviously. Uh, uh -huh. but when they can just give me six damage, I'm like, okay, like you can't. So these become huge targets because. The, the potential of them one-shotting your dudes is uh, is a problem. And, there, and you know, some of it you literally can't control. So um, that makes them really scary. I feel like some of the classes, like, um, uh, I feel like the assault-based classes were, I don't know if their AI was just confused. Sometimes they would just, like, run around in a bit of a circle, wouldn't really engage, and you could tell there was, like, this awkward kind of decision tree they were trying to follow. Um, but, yeah, so a half-half, basically. I think half were really strong and very scary, and half were kind of more like, okay, we can kill them, you know. So, which is probably how and, it should and, be. Your, and your favorite ability, healing from a distance. <laughs> I'm like, je I'm jealous. I'm jealous of that. I miss those days. Like, whenever I see that, I'm like, I just want to play vanilla XCOM now. I just want to heal from across the map. Let's go, you know. If uh, yeah. if, if I check, go and check the database and things. I'm pretty sure uh, I was the only person to die by. <laughs> Okay, well, so what does that say about your soldier? Okay, I don't know. <laughs> um, I just want to get back. Uh, I, I do want to talk yeah. about um, these two other classes, and then we we still have a couple of other things that we're going to talk about. We're not going to get through everything. Um, uh, Odd, I do apologize. I am going to have to drop. I have a hard stop. No worries, man. Uh, good luck with the move, and and thanks for all your help this season. Um, yep, it's been fun. I'll see you guys around. Take care, man. <laughs> yep, yep. Good night. Have a good one. Um, so combat engineers and uh, the phalanx class. So we have the, the combat engineer creator in here. This is uh, Cloister, right? You own this class, right? Yeah. And I then we have, we have uh, Deadput who made the, the phalanx class. And I want to say this first because I think people that watch the season and haven't actually played with the phalanx class are like, oh, that class isn't strong. Um, first of all, 100% my fault our original phalanx died because I totally misunderstood how a skill worked and that sometimes is how it goes. I think it was just bugged in that mission, wasn't it? It was a bug, yeah. It was a... It was, um, yeah. To be fair, I copied that code directly bug. from yeah. Eridar's. It was, it was I mean, a bug in Eridar's code, which is, to be honest, pretty unheard of even amongst the <laughs> modern circles. Um, yeah. Eridar is a legend of coding, so... You know, no fault of you there, Dead, but for copying that. It was make. literally a missing character. So what was the actual issue? Because I thought I had, like, misplayed Shield Wall a bunch of times or something. Misunderstanding. Um, yeah. The bug I'm talking about is that the blast plating ability that I gave them. Oh, the actual death part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for The damage reduction, because of, like, a the way I typed it in, instead of being damage reduction, it was damage... Addition. <laughs> so instead of yeah. like three to four, That's it was like awesome. four to five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but but that to was be fixed. fair, I did get her into that position because of misunderstanding the skills. Am I correct? Oh, um, no. In that case, it was because of Waffle Waffle Man got mind controlled. He panicked or whatever. It was so long ago. Yeah. And he threw the grenade, which uh, you know, killed him. To match maneuver. Because um, Waffle Man was next to the. Okay, failing. so basically I played it perfectly and it's everyone else's fault. Got yeah, it. They, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I think we're, we were talking yeah, about the thing at the us. beginning with the grenade. I think you were talking about the bit at the end where Rasa actually got killed. Yeah. Um, there no, yeah, might no, have been a little um, misunderstanding there, but I mean, the 
the whole Waffle Man thing had kind of already thrown the mission off. I loved, that was like, what, the second mission of the campaign? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when yep. that happened, you guys, I'm not gonna lie, I was very, I was pumped. I was like, that kind of stuff, uh, just when, like when we got uh, uh, Fleet's character killed with the uh, priest um, soul merge deal. Like, I love that kind of stuff for storylines, right? Like, I just think that's so memorable. I, I, it's like, it's great. It sucks to happen. And, then, and then my log where I'm like, I hope I had a, a, an awesome kick-ass death. It's yeah. Like, yeah, you totally yeah, did. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, I, I do want to talk about the Phalanx class. Um, a little bit because it didn't get a chance to shine and it kind of for me falls into the assault infantry class which again it's just my own play style for whatever reason I struggle with making those guys work and and f the reasoning that I've shared with you guys but I'll share it with the uh, people watching is that these guys need to get up close and personal most of the time to be beneficial. The challenge with getting up close and personal in a campaign like this is that you're progressing 15 tiles ahead to do something. And anytime you're progressing 15 tiles ahead, in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm going to trigger another pod. And if I'm triggering another pod, that's bad. So that's my mentality. And that's why I struggle with using an assault infantry class or a uh, a shield-based up-close-and-personal class like the Phalanx, um, just to provide some additional context. That's also why you don't see the Templars getting a ton of action in a campaign. I, I, I would rely more on a skirmisher to bring an enemy to me, right? So um, it's a playstyle thing, and I feel bad because I think that class is probably very cool in its own right. So maybe, Deadput, can you just talk a little bit about what your overall goal with that class is? is and like where do you feel that they shine like where do they fit into this system of having you know nine or ten other classes compete like where does the phalanx stand out well for starters um i think i nailed the gunslinger part um i think well i mean you didn't get a chance to really show that part off um but a big part of me wanting to like make the phalanx was in base proficiency, there isn't really gunslinger representation. Sure, a marksman can use a pistol, but they don't have any special abilities to use it. It's like, why would you ever use a pistol instead of the sniper rifle, except when you're out of ammo? Right. Um, right. And then the shield part was like, I wanted to have another support class. Like, I, I think, think, think that's part of... Uh, I think that's part of a minor problem where, like, I might have, like... Okay, they're not an assault infantry. I didn't want them to be uh, offensive base with their shield. I wanted them to be support, whether that be supporting um, your other soldiers in the back, like, say, shielding a marksman, or, like, being able to go up in front and tank stuff, trying to do uh, objectives. Mm -hmm. Like, say, say you don't have a tech specialist, you can't hack from far, but getting close we up... We basically never be... had tech specialists anyway. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I think a big problem was like taunt, like uh, without using shield rework, which is what my class was made around. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, because there's a lot of protected uh, a dodge and defense stuff is um, a big part of the balance. Yeah, and without using shield rework, that throws stuff off, and then I had to yeah like. I did some tweaks to try to make using Nashi wear work better, but like, yeah, I think I, I've heard good things from other people. Yeah, um, no, I, I, th I think it's got a lot of potential. Um, I, as I say, I, I think it's mostly like a, 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 a gameplay style thing. Um, I think the one kind of disconnect that I have with it still is if they are supposed to be really proficient with pistols, um, like their aim, at least maybe just the ones that I had. Oh, yeah, that's right. Their uh, aim was really in Struggle Town, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was another thing about not using shield rework. Their aim got penalized by not using it. Right. Okay, so yeah. maybe that's just the only... Maybe that's what I need to do differently is make sure we use that shield rework with it and that solves that problem. Yeah, uh, one thing I do want to do is, like, um, if we do use it again, I'm not sure if this be update or 2.0 version, but I want to, like, 
rechange taunt to like uh different mechanics without having to like lower defense but still provide that hey shoot at me don't you, shoot you at made my it friends. so that taunt was like the primary skill right like that was you know you wanted uh, to draw fire yeah i uh well, i'm not sure about primary skill but just like um you need you need attention taken off from your two hp guy who's gonna die right right um okay so yeah, uh, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta somehow figure out a way to to incorporate these guys uh, to the larger group. Like, have you guys played with the Phalanx class? Where do you guys think it falls? Like, what, what, what do we need to? Is this just? Is it a, a factor of being overshadowed by so many other classes? Is it? Is it? Just doesn't fit my personal play style. Like, what do you guys think? I think uh, one of the things, and I uh, really apologize for this, Dead, but it's on the rest of us. Uh, for not catching the uh, shield rework in the mod list. It's fine. It, yeah. Um, secondly, I, I feel, unfortunately, the Phalanx just got um, overshadowed as a tanking style unit by Spark Pioneers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let, while you bring that up, I think I might, for, uh, from a certain point of view, might, uh, there might be like, oh, I undertune that, but toaster is exactly what i was trying to avoid when i was making the class <laughs> like balance was entirely yeah. like yeah well you did avoid that's... that that's for sure <laughs> yeah. yeah and, and yeah. that's I mean, and I've, I've definitely seen um you know i've seen like uh i'm pretty sure it's cakers uh spartan cakers uh um campaign uh using phalanx and when you go down that gunslinger tree and you actually get one to a you know a decent high level the amount of utility of uh, pistol shots that they've got are... Who just dropped? Uh, Ant. Ah, okay. He's back. And he's back. back. Welcome back. Um, yeah, the amount of utility they actually have uh, with the gunslinger route at the end uh, for pistol shots is very similar uh, to give an idea of what that would have been like uh, is Odin in Leviathan. Okay. Uh, that's that same rough power level that the phalanx can get to um if you kind of if you take that route with them a very very good uh gunslinger correct me if i'm wrong did you not make some some aim tweaks or something uh early on in the campaign was there some aim thing that was adjusted or was it just uh defense uh i did i do believe i adjusted some aim okay stuff so like um because I it seem was, to remember when we were, when we, any shot I would take was like in the 40s. And that, that was like a turnoff. But I, again, obviously you've talked about why that, why that is. I was just trying to think of a, yeah, I just think if it's a pistol based class, they got to have better aim, right? So anyway. Um, yeah. And maybe the other thing that factors into that is, I mean, you know, low rank aim is always bad. But also, sure. most other classes you're used to using pistols with, like a marksman or a reaper or something like that, yeah. you're used to their high aim to begin with, and you tend to have them on high ground, whereas the phalanx needing to get in close usually yeah. wouldn't get that. Yeah, that's true too. Right. The, thing is, it's, the thing is, with a pistol-based class, you either go for a, a straight stand out in the open tank, which the phalanx more or less is, or you do what I've done with, the, with my gunslinger, which wasn't in this season, but I'm hoping might make it if we do proficiency for season eight, uh, which is, it's a flanker. You're reliant on flanks and crits with yeah. a pistol because it's a low damage weapon, especially with uh, weapon and item overhaul. There the is some. The, there I'll, is some, I'll just it's... say that the challenge with that again, as soon, as soon as I hear like flanking, is that positional change that you yeah. need to make and the the opportunity cost of sending in some soldier to flank to make a flank shot but maybe triggering six to ten other enemies that, that's always in the back of my mind and that's where i struggle so i think uh, maybe i just yeah, need the, to the, not worry about it who will flank the flankers right, right. Well, the, the, although the, like um i will say you can use stuff like demolition or grenades to like help open up and expose those soldiers like sure. i very much can't pistol wise i kind of envision phalanx to be more like a picker off okay Especially yeah. when using weapon item overhaul when with negative yeah. armor sh shred, yeah. like you use somebody with shred or whatever, set them up for it to be taken down. Kind of yeah. like what Odin, right? Yeah, yeah, they're 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 a very good uh, finisher. Um, I think I just went and had a look. Um, 
some notes on Discord from somebody else. And uh, one of the things that they uh, said was uh, opening up with a sapper, uh, removing cover and shredding armor, and then following up with the phalanx to finish was uh, the best way they've found to use them. Yeah. Um, I, so that low damage, but... Uh, it does make sense, but on the flip side, if somebody... Yeah, if you have to set someone up to take a shot that's out of cover, any soldier can do that. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, true. Yeah, I, no, I think that's fair. Yeah, there's a reason I get the use case, Claymore. Yeah, the, the use case there is um, if you've kind of got that set up and that enemy only now needs like four points damage, Yeah, are you going to use the 17 point damage Frostcaster Bolt Sniper? <laughs> Oh. Or are you Yeah, because to... it's cool. <laughs> yeah, or are you going to use the perfectly positioned phalanx who's already tanking, you know, with just that little chip damage sure. to yeah. kill that enemy. And, yeah. and that's... I think he literally killed a 1 HP enemy with a 17 <laughs> damage shot from the bolt that... caster yeah. in the bio. Because it's cool. <laughs> they deserved it. They deserved it. That, yeah. yeah, but e e oh. equally, killing something like an avatar with a golden gun face off yeah. is also very cool yeah. yeah um one final major kind of self-criticism about phalanx um from myself is that uh, let's take the mother uh, as an example she's a really good support class the bottom tree phalanx was okay so the top tree was more about, about for them being taken up themselves I think their support for other soldiers is definitely part of their weakest part of their tree. And it's right. something, if we ever use phalanx again, like, I do want to change it up. Like, a, a lot of phalanx was, like, taken from so perk packs and stuff because I wasn't knowledgeable on making perks myself. Yeah. Uh, but I should try making my own perks to, like, fit them in the defensive like what i want to to achieve in that goal yeah i think i, I think the biggest piece of advice i can give i'm not a modder but i play with a lot of uh modded classes over the past few years is to try and come up with an identity of what that class is and what their true purpose is and then like be super intensely focused on making them like that and yeah the we're going to talk about the combat engineer next, which kind of goes exactly opposite of that. Um, but because it did that, it has made it its own unique class. But I just feel like if you have a clear definition of what that class should be, it, it's going to make your other choices a, a hell of a lot easier. But that hard yeah. part is coming up with that clear definition, in my opinion. Indeed. I have, in the past, while I've made class mods, I've had easier time making classes that have like two class trees instead of like three like how proficiency does yeah yeah so so, so it is tough when you got like so many oh it's not easy do. no it's not easy but making perks is definitely one of the hardest yeah yeah I, I, was, I was gonna say yeah dead but and this is obviously from somebody who also builds classes i think the phalanx is biggest um issue is the fact that it's trying to do two things at once yeah, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, it's trying to I mean, split yeah. being a tank and being a gunslinger, and yeah. not quite managing both. But it is still a really good class. A lot of people in there's the, a, uh, this yeah, class a lot of people love it. No, it's it great. To amazing effect, dude. Yeah. Like, don't knock yourself down. Yeah. No. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not. I'm not trying. I'm not being too hard on myself. I'm just trying to be. I'm trying. I'm just trying to grab myself. Not like for sure. Know, think everything's all right, or that oh, this is the worst class that's ever been on the workshop. No, no, no. no. I, and it's yeah, not, and like I said, a lot of it. A lot of the the at least how it showed in my season was on me personally in my play style, and that's not a bad thing. It's just that's how it is. Um, uh, I think it could also just be like how we set up on the enemy side. It could just sure. been like. Yeah. Like it, it, it was bad for like uh, assault infantry. It's basically, anybody that need to be close, it just wasn't a good time for. Another thing that um, we did have uh, a dark event where like everybody, every enemy got like armor and stuff, and because yeah. that their pistol had like uh, it's negative armor pierce. It's I don't know, very confusing, but right. that also further kind of hampered their 
possible usefulness, right? Yeah, I think probably yeah. uh, an overabundance on mutant mutant style enemies as well. Yeah, it's really hampered because you that really need is, big damage. Yeah, and the counter attack on the melee attacks, you know, that was a big contending factor to being able to uh, use the shield bash on a phalanx. Yeah, effectively. Yeah. So, uh, Deadput, thank you so much for, for making the class, first of all. It's definitely a class I want to try again um, and try to work it in because I think it's got a lot of potential. Um, so I'm very excited to see where you take it. And uh, yeah. thanks for all the um, work on that. To all the YouTube commenters that will be likely be there, um, if you got your own feedback about how trying to prove that kind of thing, because I do still want it to be h half like pistol base and half shield base. Yeah. Like send me suggestions right whether on the mod page or on discord whatever just send me suggestions if you got any, any really good ideas awesome um let's get into the combat engineer i don't think we need to spend a ton of time on this uh here's here's my thoughts i'll share it and you guys if you disagree with anything uh let me know combat engineer is essentially and we've talked about this internally a lot uh jack of all trades master of none that is kind of the design philosophy. Is that would that be fair to say, Cloista? Like, is that where you land uh, on that? It's a tank and crowd control class. It is built to effectively be the perfect sixth member of a squad. Yeah, and i I would think that it, I I will say that I I think that it is. Um, thinking back to like the Leviathan mission, if you guys watched the whole video at the end, I kind of. <laughs> lamented a bit about bringing uh, uh, a, a sapper because very limited consumables. The way I run them with that shotgun is like I use that for the guaranteed damage or maybe I'm getting up close and personal uh, when, the, when the opportunity presents itself. But in almost every situation throughout Leviathan, uh, a combat engineer would have provided a lot more than the sapper did. Um, that said, I do feel like the classes a little bit too strong it almost does too many things um because by the time they hit like middle rank the the jack of all trades master of none kind of falls apart a little bit because they're a jack of all trades master of most right they have the exact same suppression ability as marines which makes mar like that's the no, core don't. the core marine thing I'm sure they do no, they don't don't they? they don't get no man's land in their main trees it's, okay um, no man's land perk. sure but well, they, okay they, they don't have every perk but the, uh, they're not I exact think... copies that's not what i'm saying but this the strongest part arguably of a marine is that they can disorient on suppression yeah right yeah, yeah. and and so can combat engineers i'm just trying to draw like likenesses right they have yeah. a lot of explosives similar to a sapper then they can also uh, carry a heavy cannon. They have a uh, flame uh, gauntlet. They have defensive mines that they can drop. They have uh, a lot of shields. They have pretty high mobility. Um, they're just they're strong. They're a strong class, and they're fun to play because of all of that stuff. Um, but in my opinion, if I had to rank classes in terms of like um, opness. <laughs> don't take that out of context uh combat engineers are going to be up there because they just have so much that they can always contribute in every fight do you know what i'm saying i think yeah, one of the which drawbacks of combat engineers comes to if you're in a long engagement uh keeping up their toolbox becomes a real challenge if you take um and i've had this personally combat engineers on an, an avenger defense you think yeah. it's a really good idea oh they've got all these cool toys and stuff i can use mm -hmm. and then seven rounds later and you've still got 30 enemies to go and you're down to uh one flamer left and a cannon mm -hmm. and you're like um but you still have that cannon and i think yeah. i think maybe that's like a like a subtle tweak I, i'm sure you've thought about it but is there a reason that you went cannon instead of rifle for balancing purposes just to kind of maybe limit them a little bit more i'm just curious bear in mind bear in mind it's not just cannon they also have option for shotgun sure yeah and they have the cannon they actually have the, the cannon is at is technically a negative 
Okay. Because if you're running YO, cannon redu reduces their mobility. They need their mobility to get in position for their flamer. Yes. So you're balancing the use of one versus the use of the other. I could see that. Right, although they've got tons of inherent mobility to make up for that. That's that's exactly the, the point, yeah. So, yeah, because yeah. unlike Marines, Marines get really hit pretty hard with the negative mobility, while yeah. that's never much of an issue with the uh, um, combat engineer. And it's not even too bad, because I, if I recall, combat engineer could use her flamers through cover as well, right? Uh, it depends on... Because um, it's taking round. the heavy weapon. It goes round... It depends. If you're using the heavy weapon tweaks mod, it will go round the cover. If you're not, it won't. So that's also okay. an, a, an, in, whether an intended, unintended interaction. Right. But you've also got the fact that, yes, up until they get... Yeah. It's up until you get to that point where you get the option for Shred on the Flamer or Anti-Armor Doctrine, they're nearly useless against mechs. Yeah. Yeah, know. that's fair. Yeah, that's true. That's one of their downsides. I mean, I mean, they have their... The idea is they have their counters. Yeah. There's yeah. just few of them. That's the thing. Yeah. And But here's my thought as far as, you know, usage and competition. You know, close you were talking about wanting them to be, to be kind of the perfect sixth member of a squad. I think in a lot of ways that worked. I mean... Combat engineers saw a lot of use in terms of how many different mission appearances they had. They were actually slightly ahead of marksmen. And then, but you look at who they were competing with, okay, what classes do they take elements from? Sapper, definitely. Sapper was the most used class of the season. Um, Marine, the other thing they really borrowed from, was the second most used. So I feel like the combat engineer kind of carved out its role reasonably well, but without really taking away from too many other classes. That's one of the cool things about this class, because it is kind of like a conundrum, right? Where it does have so much utility, and they can kind of do everything. But at the same time, uh, there's other classes that are are better for certain things. And so, like, you know, when we're talking about um, the Phalanx class and trying to find an identity that's very specific, you kind of went the opposite route with the Combat Engineer, and it works. Like, that's... That's cool. I think that's I think, great. I think the other thing, the other thing that we can thank the uh, combat engineer for is a small skill called uh, cloister kinetic plating. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And cloister shielding. Yeah, the cloister shielding was nice. I love that. Yeah. Thanks, Rusty. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, technically, Enjoyed thanks, Cyrodiil, because we pinched that for we uh, borrowed a lot of code from uh, Null Ward. Uh, Null yeah. Ward. Yeah. Um. So I've completely lost my train of thought. No, that's okay. We we can wrap up on the classes. I actually feel like um I know Kex, you kind of had a note here like need some tweaks, mostly didn't work. Like it just to kind of finish it off. Is there anything here that um you want to add that we didn't touch on already? Um not really. I think we 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 covered everything nicely. Um the only thing that I would add to that last uh topic is if you're rolling six soldiers for the vast majority of the campaign, uh, moving forward, I would I, I don't have an answer, but I think that we definitely need to go with less classes. Uh, I think the overabundance of classes, because, I mean, we're talking, we had Combat Engineer, Phalanx, Den Mother, Sparks, which were three, plus the six, and then the three faction heroes. I think it was like 14 classes. So it's like, it, it, it becomes a little bit, instead of having too many awesome choices, it started kind of feeling like so many choices became overwhelming and, and, and in a weird sense, kind of limiting. So maybe more forward. 100% agree. Yeah. agree. I don't know how we, how we fix that, but I guess, uh, I think one of the things that we ran into this season, and we do it every season, is, uh, oh, we, got, we should add this. Oh, let's add this. Oh, also yeah. let's add this, <laughs> and it just yeah, it, it, it yeah. kind of like mod then, power creep happens, you know? Yeah, because we've added this, this, and this, we then need to do uh, the XCOM arms race and add that, 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 which yeah, yeah and constantly uh, buffing each side to a point of uh, overpower brokenness. Yeah, N not to literally prove your point immediately, 
but I've always wondered whether a mod like um, there's a mod where you can, can set up squads kind of like in in Long War 2. We talked about that yeah. before this. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, that might have been before I joined because I kind of joined midstream. OK. Um, where that might kind of give you some structure of groups of soldiers that you could take out. Mm hmm. You know, and th that might even allow you to kind of be like, well, you know, these soldiers work together and these soldiers work together and may maybe even could help with bringing more soldiers out because you kind of have, you know, this group. I mean, obviously, you're not constrained yeah. to, you know, the, 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 the squads biggest... don't constrain you on who to bring out. Yeah. But that, maybe that's kind of an organizing thing. Yeah. That's the biggest problem with the uh, squad based mod that's out there at the moment. The, the, there's a really good one by General Disarray shout him out uh he done an awful lot of work pulling a very complex thing out of uh, long war of the chosen uh by um uh, the long war of the chosen uh, dev team and making it a standalone um the the issue with it is really really good it allows you to set up squads it allows you to integrate uh like small teams of people uh with the idea that you rotate those teams but it doesn't actually enforce it so if you've got a squad and three of that squad are injured, shaken, um, you can just plug in three other members instead. So yeah, it would be of... one of those things you got to have some pretty solid house rules behind. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's what I was getting. At. Yeah. The challenge with house rules for me is that uh, you're doing it to impose like a self hampering uh, system usually. And I find that when we got to do that, it's just another thing to manage in a, in a, especially this campaign, a campaign where I felt like there was a lot to manage constantly. And I think that could just slow things down a bit. But I, I think the intention fleet, correct me if I'm wrong, is to have um, more soldiers represented and more mm -hmm. classes uh, represented. But mm -hmm. it does suffer on the strategy side because, I mean, it's, it's limiting for obvious reasons. I will say, I do, th correct me if I'm wrong, but I do feel like the past few seasons, um, soldier representation has been a lot more uh, varied than in previous seasons. You stats guys would probably know better, but are we not seeing more unique soldiers being used over the past couple of seasons? Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Um, these these last two seasons, definitely yes. Um, okay. I think prior to last season, we the most soldiers we'd ever seen in a season was about forty that actually went on missions. And both these past two seasons, it's been sixty or more. Okay. I wonder. It, it, probably too much work for you to look up quickly, but it'd be interesting to see how many soldiers um, in a season go on like three missions or more, like actual um, fighting missions, not covert actions. I don't know if that's an easy thing you can look up in your tables, but um, that would be, I think, pretty good representation of like how active they are. And, and look, for me, like I, I try to get people involved because it's cool. People have submitted these soldiers and I want to get as much representation as possible. But I, I need to balance that with, hey, we're at force level 15 and I only have mag weapons and uh, I need like the best of the best to, or we will lose. And that's the that's the balancing act that I try to walk. You know, so and I think I guess my my perspective on that also is part of that is maybe anticipating that problem earlier on in the sense that if you have more higher ranked people available, then it's not quite as much of a problem of we only have eight captains right now. And they all have to go out on this mission. Yeah. You know, totally. Where if you had, instead yeah. of you have 10 or 12 captains available, that's maybe less of a problem. Yeah. But of course, then, you know, it takes more effort to get that many people up to that rank as well. So that's yeah. kind of the trade off, too. Yeah. It's, it's hard because, like, you do want to balance the strategy with the, the viewer experience, like we've talked about. But um, mm -hmm. I do, I do think it's gotten better. Like, I mean, it, it has. Um, you know, you look back to the first couple seasons. I mean, we were taking out the same soldiers on every mission, and they were that's how they set a lot of records, right? Um, right. And, and I, I do think it's more fun to see a variety of soldiers, and that's why I like having 
uh, a higher amount of classes. Um, but at the same time, having too many classes, mm, then, you know, there's, there's something's going to get left out. Something is always going to fall to the wayside because strategically it's not as, as important to bring them, right? So, right. yeah. Um, I took a quick look at the database and about, uh, I mean, I, I didn't click on individual missions or whatever, yeah. but 18 soldiers from this season barracks did not get kills, which I'm going to presume that mostly means those 18 soldiers never went on any active missions. Yeah, that's probably right. So, so like, while it has been better, I mean, of course, any, uh, I was going to say it could be better, but, you know, anything could be, everything could be better, right? Yeah, and I think if you were to go back to earlier seasons, um, that number is probably uh, lower because we just didn't recruit any. Do you know what I mean? Like, and also... Like, um, covert covert, covert infiltration totally changes the way that you play the game. And, like, it's unavoidable to have covert op bots. And I kind of love that, you know, every yeah. season there's one of those guys, like Bobo, you know, that just kind of becomes that role. Um oh. So that's kind of fun. Uh, classes, are we are we good here? We're gonna move on to like our final uh, kind of section here. Are you guys still good for energy? Are we okay to wrap yeah. this up? Everyone's yeah. alive. Yeah. Rusty, are you are you still okay over there? Yeah, thirty six hour day. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing great. Okay. Um, but, yeah, I just need to uh, refill my water. Yeah, no problem, man. Yeah. You know so, what? Uh, I, I was going to go as well. For, I'll be back in like 30 seconds. Yeah, no worries, man. So uh, enemy variety, I think we all agree that yes, this has been probably one of the best seasons for enemy variety. If we look at uh, more of the, the macro and we analyze like specific missions, could there be, you know, some more variety within any given mission? Yeah, maybe. But over the course of the campaign, I, I feel like um, it was really good. Especially uh, the Muton Department, uh, Venators, I hate that unit. Um, the Black Ice Codex was cool. The Psy, the Psy Bursters were, I hated them as well. And when I say hated, I mean like, that's a good thing. Like when I hate yeah, them, yeah, that they, means they're they did their job. good. They did their job. Yeah. yeah, they did their job. Um, the, uh, the rulers were really <laughs> annoying uh, to deal with. The um, the children of the king rulers were also really annoying, and I have some thoughts on those. But oh, yeah, the what do you guys think? What talking strictly enemies? What do you guys want to spend the next couple of minutes talking about? I think this goes back to one of the things that we started right at the beginning: uh, enemy composition and your entire campaign enemy loadout with encounter lists. Yeah. It's such a delicate thing to get the balance yeah. correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very. Um, I actually rather like the enemies that we had in this in this season, and I do. The step away from the ABA Bio Division staple core. Yeah. Uh, definitely forced some new things in. Yeah, and to uh, be fair, definitely. I liked ABA, and I really enjoyed um, uh, Bio Division for different reasons. But I, I yeah. do agree with you that this season's, I feel like we're probably close to the best makeup we've had. Yeah, I've got to say, I've, I've always absolutely loved Ashlyn Lee's enemies. Yes. Um, yeah, and uh, the Ahad War Radians from Rishi. Rishi. Um, yeah, those are really good. Though that First time you see that mute on the claw, uh, do its clumsy move. And yeah, it's just like, awesome. You can't not laugh at it. Yeah. And those little bits really yeah. make Anybody else? Oh, um, on topic of alien rulers. Yep. I uh, oh man, it's been it's so many little small things that like end up creating such a terrifying experience, especially compared to the chosen. Mm -hmm. Like, let's say a ruler region. Um, good idea for like vanilla scale the counters, but I think that was one of the biggest contributions to annoyance of seasons because even when you like. <laughs> make them piss off to wherever they came from they come back it's like hey uh i went to the doctor and everything's all fixed yeah, up yeah 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 they're coming back pretty strong it, it, i really struggle with rulers more than ever this season i feel um well you only killed one of the original rulers i think the well queen thanks for rubbing it in yeah. sweet <laughs> 
No, uh, you're, yeah, you're right. It was it was very hard to finish them off. Like, I I, I think yeah. um, part of the challenge this campaign is um, uh, I got a little bit behind in terms of uh, research, and it's always it's always those things where it's like, oh, you've got this really cool breakthrough. T yeah, ten days, sure, but then it's ten days here, ten days there. And if you take a couple of diversions, then all of a sudden mag weapons are two months later than they should be, right? And I think um, that kind of stuff, we haven't talked about a lot, but I, I do feel like that had a an impact for sure on how difficult things were at that first kind of 33% of the way through the campaign. Um, yeah. I really think uh, the issues we've chosen as well that in that first third of the campaign where it was no chosen, no chosen, no chosen, and then just back to back. <laughs> um, chosen missions for, I think, eight in a row, nine in a row. Yeah. Uh, until that was like a deep-seated, rooted bug uh, in base game uh, um, code that, yeah. you know, Zymanic, like, the dude's a genius. Yeah. Uh, how he found it and fixed it amazing but that bug has been sat there in the code yeah all this time um and then finally came up to the surface and that was its manifestation it's like yeah yeah and that's one of the cool things too about doing these these campaigns and having like a direct line of communication with um you guys is that there are so many like people don't see this but over the course of the campaign if i'm running 300 mods I guarantee you that 200 of them are updated at least once over the course of the campaign. And some of them, I would say like probably 40 of them get multiple updates throughout a campaign. So it's, it's interesting to see what people are, are finding and what kind of bugs still persist, even though so much work has gone into these um, in advance. You just can't catch everything, you know? Um, it's just one of the fascinating things for me being not a modder that, um, you guys have to go through to like find these bugs and, and provide yeah. a solution. Like that's pretty wild. Yeah, and definitely. I think any of the guys here, uh, would agree that, um, you try and as, as a modder, you try your best to think of every possible hypothetical situation that you can think of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. and then cover, um, that outcome in your code so you know if a b c happens d e and f is going to follow yeah and then someone will come along and go but i start the alphabet at z <laughs> yeah well bro that's that's game development right like people are you're making a yeah. game you're trying to do a certain thing you think people are going to play it a certain way you release it to the public nobody's playing it the way you intended and all of a sudden your whole balance is whacked and you're like i didn't think about that like that's how it is you know and that happens so often and so often um you know it's definitely one of the things in the next subject coming up <laughs> yeah yeah no, um, and that that's that's a good point we'll get there yeah uh yeah it's definitely difficult to plan for some sometimes so we're all in agreement that um the enemy variety was was pretty solid um yeah uh, the chosen change don't move a muscle that's specific to the hunter Whereas instead of having a range of, of movement that we had to get to, um, to get out of his kind of cone of attack, he pinned somebody in place, basically. And this would stack a, a defense uh, debuff, if I'm not mistaken, as well, every time he targeted um, that uh, soldier. I personally liked the change, if not for any other reason than um, variety. Um, but in some situations, it was like, Okay, he's targeting him, so I just won't move. You know what I mean? And then you're like, okay, fine. So you hunker them down and you just move on. Um, whereas the old world, you are forced to move a soldier a pretty long distance, which could then create other issues, especially um, considering triggering other pods. So, like, what are your guys' thoughts on that specific change that we made? I love it. Personally, um, <clears throat> in my own campaigns, it has made a, a, a big difference because... Uh, like yourself, I also run diverse aliens and uh, a pretty nasty yellow alert. So to me, what that means is, um, yeah, I might hunker down, but I, I have, 
like you, I'm like, okay, I got 27 <laughs> enemies. Yeah. So uh, yeah. My, now, and this one's pinned down. And my, now my job is I got to whittle down that number because whoever's remaining is going to shoot at that one that's pinned down. Yeah. So I yeah. have to, I have to make sure that they survive. So I, I really like that change. Yeah. Uh, and overall, yeah, I think that the, the variety has been amazing. Mocks, the additions, the removals. I think everything has been great. The only thing that I think we can still uh, work on just in terms of maybe a variety or better functionality for, for moving forward in the future are the rulers mm-hmm. just to just, just, just see what we can do in that department because I think everything else has been pretty cool. Do you Honestly, guys feel that difficult. rulers, like, difficulty-wise, let's talk base game rulers first. Do you guys feel that they're, like, challenging? Because I do. I mean, I struggled with them a lot this season. I normally actually find them a pushover. Yeah. Because so I've played the game enough now that I know exactly when to expect them. I know how to, you know, read, oh, it's been three missions. This one's going to have the Viper King on. So what do you, in your opinion, what do you think I personally struggled with with the rulers this season? I think this season, um, it was basically from where we asked you to switch off uh, integrated and story missions. So having the rulers roam free was a a bit of a shock to the system, especially when, you know, force level four and the Viper King comes around and you're still (laughs) off on the sticks. Yeah, yeah. uh, completely not planning to see him yeah yeah, That's yeah, fair. Always yeah. Nasty so I, you know i don't quite know what can be done going forward uh to to fight them but that's also the intention of the rulers you know they're meant to mess you up yeah um, yeah for sure and i yeah. i do feel like having them not locked to a facility is in my opinion more enjoyable because it's a surprise and it's like you never know what to expect what fleet? Yeah, I'm curious on your opinion here because I know you've you, you might get, talked you know, about the Circuit Queen mission with you know seven. Uh, oh, I, I need to go. Uh, okay, <laughs> thanks for coming, man. Yeah, later, Have a good night. Bye. Yeah. Have a good day, good night, here. Uh, fleet. Do you have any thoughts on rulers? Actually, think I I I think the rulers did pretty well this season. I think one of the things, you know, you asked what kind of uh, um, maybe made them difficult for you to handle this time. Yeah. I I think Yellow Alert kind of made, you know, if you're facing the ruler and also, by the way, eight other enemies are running at you. Yeah. You know, you kind of have to divide your attention where normally you might just be like, focus the ruler. Yeah. You know, so a lot of times instead of trying to get maximum damage on a ruler so you can maybe set them up to kill next time. You know, it was just like get them, oh, get them away. Yeah, get so the I gate up, and like then I can focus on not dying. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, strangely enough, the same issue you had with Mokek with Exalt. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's a good point. Yeah. So it all comes yeah, back but, to um, Yellow um, Alert. That is the problem. Got it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is the brilliance of it. I think that's the strength because I think yeah. in a very similar fashion, both the rulers and the chosen. <laughs> what makes them challenging is the fact that you have to deal with them and other enemies. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I think that the assassin is the the quote unquote harder one of the three. Because out of the three, she's the only one that dives in to fight you while yeah. you're oh, facing yeah. six and she other can mutants. Get, she's guaranteeing she's hitting you. Yeah, for sure. While the other two just stay at the very back. So it's like, okay, so let me kill these 17 mutons and 12 sectopods. And once you're I just, done, I just, just wish, I just wish there was a middle ground where, like, I just want yellow alert to maybe be less aggressive. You know, Orange like, alert. maybe sometimes I am just fighting one pod and then I get to move on. Or maybe sometimes I'm fighting a, a pod and one stumbles in and then I'm fighting it. But, like, the way that it is currently, it's just I'm fighting every pod in the same spot on every mission, right? So, it just I don't know. That, comes, that comes back to that, you know, unfortunate bane of modders, which yeah. is that, you know, balance is hard. Yeah. No, it is. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think that is the key message that I want to, that I want people watching and listening to kind of take away from this is like, this stuff is not an easy, like, just do this and it, it's going to work, right? Um, yeah. It, we want to kind of share this as a behind-the-curtain thing. And I think that, um, you know, that's that's a very apparent throughout our discussion that this it is hard. 
to do. Um, let's maybe use that to kind of springboard into the next section because psionics, in my opinion, last season, uh, we saw how strong it was. The uh, clarity of mind into double null lance that everybody hated that I kept doing because like it was 40 damage. Why would I not? It works, exactly. It works, yeah. Um, that was strong. And you guys took a lot of feedback. Like, I remember a lot of discussions and a lot of uh, comments that I read on the Steam page and on Discord about how OP it is and whatever. Keep in mind, it was fun, right? And, like, I will always lean towards something that's fun and OP versus something that's boring and op like you really nailed how fun that was to use that system so you took all this feedback and you implement this will drain system which in my opinion was a super smart the right way to do it and for a first implementation pretty well implemented like i thought that it went off without a hitch i didn't run into any bugs with it um, yeah, I, I felt it's it, the idea of it was that I can't just be spamming um, uh, psionic abilities all the time, every single turn. And you could feel that if you had a longer mission, like, oh crap, I literally can't cast anything. What am I going to do? I got to suck out some willpower from somebody else. So, like, do you guys want to talk about that a little bit and and where you think that mod stands currently and what what you kind of hope to do with it going forward? So one of the first things I'd like to say is uh, I can't believe in the entire season you hit a clarity coma once. <laughs> okay, yeah. stats, guys. How many times did I try clarity of mind? Do we know? Probably not. I, I don't know. I would have to go don't look. Know. I mean, honestly the, don't think it was that high, though. Like, maybe I did a clarity of mind maybe 10 times. I, I think it was more than that. I, I I'd have know. to check to see when. Definitely less than twenty. Definitely less than. 20. I don't know. I'd if have it to was check to see more. when you started actually taking psionics out because it was really yeah. late. It was really late. That's, that's, the, that's the thing. Yeah. But but once you did, you probably did it at least once a mission when you had psionics out. Yeah, I it's don't just know. that there weren't that many missions. Yeah, I think I think, however, for the one mission that it did proc on, <laughs> and the position it procked in. Yeah showed that if we can tweak the numbers uh, correctly um, to have them in a position where it procs yeah. enough, not too much, that it's... It like, was Network um, Tower, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Network Tower on a very crucial... Uh, you spent um, yeah. about six minutes planning a move, um, and the Clarity Coma just went, nope, Sounds it's gone berserk. Right. Yeah. Which, it, such a great mechanic, by the way. Um, I do remember you debating a lot about how frequently that should proc when you were talking about implementing this. So, like, can you yeah. walk us through how you kind of yeah. decided on what you decided? Well, first of all, we took into account that when we initially brought it up, you said you hated the idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I did. Because I was like, if it's too high, the, if the percentage is too high, I'll just never use it. Because I didn't want to be in the situation that I was in on Network Tower, right? Yeah, I think the issue, uh, the definite kind of balancing issue um, with uh, Clarity of Mind is it's a ridiculously overpowered perk. Yeah. You know it is. Yeah. And it's designed to be. When you consider what you're giving up strategy-wise to get someone there, mm -hmm. uh, the resources to build the pecs, well, the research, the yeah. resources yeah. to build it, the upgrade, the time to train someone, and then to actually take them out. Yeah. Um, but for the perk. And having it tiered across uh, combat intelligence. Oh, what a genius implementation. One of my favorite things I've seen in the entire game, by the way. That is, that's such a cool, unique way of, of doing it. Uh, having that cooldown change based on uh, their combat intelligence. Like, bravo. Like, that's, that's it's awesome. Not just cool down. It's not just cooldown change. And it's the number of charges. And no, sure. Power. Yeah, sure. And yeah. Uh, their side offense bonus as well. Yeah all balanced off of that that's it's really cool so what we were trying to aim to do with that is it should have kind of been like every kind of 20 uh, percent. it's one in five uh, is supposed to proc that okay uh, with 
you know, mitigations from the player, like Solace would have negated it and Mind Shield would have negated it. So if you were taking out someone on low will, uh, equipping them with a Mind Shield would have, you know, stopped them going crazy from clarity. Um, and you are, you know, the, the, the times when you're planned to kind of use clarity of mind, and this is one of those things I was saying, like you can plan as much as you want, but someone might just not play that way. Um, one of its other purposes is to top up your will. So the idea behind that and the incentive behind making it top up your will is that you're going to use it when you're at low will, which makes you more susceptible to getting the clarity coma in the first place. Um, and you still get the will top up back. So when you do get your soldier back, you can continue doing what you're planning. But it's just that break interruption in uh, effort. What am I going to do now? Yeah, and that's what we were trying to capture with uh, the clarity of mind changes in Pexm. So, uh, what's the next evolution of this? What What did you learn from the campaign and from feedback that you're hearing that you want to implement? So, one of the things that Cloister and I have been discussing uh, recently is we think that the flat rate fifteen percent will per any psionic ability um, is too easy. It's it, it's too easy. Um, especially when you consider the utility of, say, casting soul fire to casting no lance. Sure. Um, no or lance, double lance. Or, or even a double no lance. You yeah. Know, yeah. Massively different. Uh, Who's casting a single no lance? Like, come on. Yeah, no one casts single. <laughs> <laughs> casting a single no? What are you doing? You always double no. Everyone knows that. Um. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, so, I, I've yeah. distracted you. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, so you want to make it harder to cast stuff. So yeah, so we want to make it harder to cast. And one of the ways that we've come up with doing this and we're testing it at the moment, uh, which is one of the things I'll say, like PexM uh, is one of the biggest mods I think Cloister and I have. And before it even gets to the public, we've got a whole Discord server that we test on, like 20, 30 of us yeah. uh, pass this mod around. It goes through several dev changes in between each public release. Yep. Um, and there's, you know, code is scrutinized over, it's optimized. We try to make it as bug free as possible, as crash free as possible, and think of everything we can. And that's before it even gets out to the public. Yeah. Um, th there's a rather large process there. Um, and what we want to try and do is, and what we've discussed, is that the gems are going to be tiered. So a, uh, a Soulfire gem will be like a tier one gem, and it will only be like a 15% will drain, and it only needs 15% of your will to be able to cast it. Sounds easy. But a no Lance gem is going to be a tier three gem, and it's going to be 45% of your will being drained. And that's it's a actually not. Well, it's you know, between fun. You forty-five percent because we yeah. love RNG. Um, <laughs> yeah, but that's yeah. a massive chunk to possibly give up. And if you're at like a hundred percent will, yeah, fair enough. You might get to that double no lance. Yeah. Um, yeah, but you just might not because yeah. you might get drained completely and have to readjust your plans. Yeah, because even though when you uh, clarity um, and it and it becomes free, that's only in terms of action points. It's still draining your will, right? Yeah, yeah, it's still yeah. draining your will. And your clarity of mind is replenishing a small amount of will as well. Twenty percent at the moment. Uh, I guess. Set, set twenty percent at the moment. Okay. So we've got it set flat at the moment. I yeah. Think. So I, I think you guys are literally a couple tweaks away from perfecting this thing. Um, it's really fun to play with. And yeah, I think having the tiered structure, like being able to mind control, dominate someone, null lance somebody, that flaming lance was pretty cool. Um, uh, there's some there's some in there that are, yes, less powered, so they should, they should require less will. I think that's the right approach. I think that's awesome. Um, yeah. Like, it's really yeah, cool to see the evolution season to season for that. Because now it's like a no-brainer mod for me. Like, I would never not use it, you know? Thank you. Well, thank you. I was going to say, we've, uh, our, one big challenge with balancing PEXM, of course, is the fact that, you know, this is 
proposes is still technically <laughs> 3.1 at the moment. Yeah. Bear in mind, I created 1.0 on my own three years ago. Yeah, then that's I crazy. Thought, well, I wanted to do 2.0. Spoke to Rusty. He was like, that's a really cool idea. We got 2.0 out. <laughs> and then we, and we st- immediately crazy. started talking about what we wanted to do with it. <laughs> This crazy idea of, hey, no one on the modding scene at all has created a brand new Avenger facility from scratch. Yeah. That, that alone uh, was a massive amount of work. Uh, I'm project lead. I'm allowed to be demanding. <laughs> and finally, finally, it has people in it after two years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, but that's cool. Yeah. Like, you guys just continue to improve it every bit time. Polish like that that go into a mod that, you know, those little things aren't really kind of considered. Um, yeah. uh, no one kind of considers the time that goes into doing the stuff like that. Yeah. Or the yeah, screenshots but... that go on the Steam page or, you know, Kex will probably say this, you know. Kex, how how long do you spend making the previews for, like, your clothing packs? Oh, those, those, is, those are probably an entire day. Sometimes I spend, uh, like, a, a session just of 10 to 12 hours just taking pictures for That's the mod crazy. presentation. Yeah. yeah. So that's like a bit of a behind the scenes of making a mod is there's a lot more to it than most people kind of realize. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah just, just one question regarding the psionics, like open to, to, to everybody. Uh, one of the goals and the changes that we had between season six and season seven was uh, diluting the gem pool with lesser gems in the goal to kind of scale back that overpoweredness. Do you guys think that we succeeded in that department in terms of adding more lesser gems so that we diluted the pool? Do you guys think we succeeded there? See, this is actually um, something I was going to try and I was about to come on to. Um, no, because I was, was going to say, <laughs> was gonna say, one of the biggest problems we have with balancing it is, yes, we're supporting so many more perk packs. Yeah. And... Okay. Uh, what, yeah. Even with that variety, we still can't compete with odd luck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and definitely like one of the goals of PEXM is it's a framework. We have tried our best to not touch any other author's actual perks. They're just included as you know, rolled into a gem, able to put on a Siam as they are. No further changes from PEXM because it's not it's not on us to adjust the other perk but we also want to be able to use all these other awesome perks that other mod makers have been making that they haven't managed to cycle into like a class or into their own systems mitz Rooty's um, perk packs are a key and an obvious one there he's got so many psionic perks yeah yeah definitely but Pexum's the only one that uses them yeah, For, yeah. like mitz Rooty is a is a really really good perk content creator a really good ability creator but hasn't got much that puts those perks in. You need a vehicle to deliver them. And that's what you guys have made. And that's what we're trying to do with uh, the Psionic perks in in PEXM. I will say to to address the um, variety thing is like, I felt like there was more variety, but when something like, when an S tier gem comes up like Null Lance or like a Domination, you're like, oh, hell yeah. Yeah. You know? Of course. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of like the the fire based ones. There was an acid ball, a fireball, um, the Sharon, acid ball, which for some reason didn't work. I don't think there was. I remember uh, using acid, it one time and then never uh, bringing it. So, it's a bit of a weird one. It only does shred. It does shred and acid damage. Um, but yeah, doesn't. when I cast it, it d- I just didn't do anything. But um, yeah. uh, I I don't know. I felt like the gem variety was better, but. You know, at the end of the day, when you get these ones, you're gonna you're gonna use them. Uh, so I know we yeah, added that I, in well, hopes of finding them fewer times, and we probably did on the whole. But we found like two dominations, uh, a mind control, which I actually think now is stronger than domination because of yellow alert. Um, right. Uh, the some of my favorite ones were like the I keep wanting to call it soul merge, but what is the one where you like give the extra action and the stat boost? What's that called? Uh, soul, merge. soul merge that is soul merge oh, oh it is soul merge okay yeah. yeah i feel like that's one of the most op uh gems for whatever yeah. reason right. um, it's, it's just very strong yep um i'm sorry okay uh two things 
about gen variety, I feel like one of the only ways to really enforce that, which I mean, whatever's good or bad, is if uh, you could only have like say one gem at a time, or you could only research one gem at a time. You could maybe find yeah. multiple in the field, but um, oh, oh. Yeah. can I? Uh, but can I thing, suggest something? The exclusive gems would be a good thing to think to work forward. Uh, well, one more thing, not before you speak. Yeah. The other thing I was thinking is that a lot of like the strength is that you could just freely remove your gem from a psionic app at will, like at any time. Same with like weapon attachments, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Like I think uh, maybe gems are more permanent. Yeah, like I I think a lot of the strength uh, when it comes to toys and stuff like that is that like we can move things around freely compared to vanilla where really good say weapon attachments are like just stuck on a weapon, right? Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying, Dad, but uh, there's two routes, I think, there. Either A, we could have them so that they lock in. Uh, so once they're placed on a Siamp, they're on that Siamp, and you're not taking them off. Uh, or the other route is is that we go the route that, yes, you can put them on and take them off, but taking them off destroys them. <laughs> and, and that means oh, that that's could, interesting. Yeah. Uh, that means that, like, if you've got a, a Tier 1 app, and you've put a couple of gems on it, and they're not quite working out, and you get something else better come along, i.e. that S-tier domination gem that you're going to want, you remove the soul fire gem, you've now destroyed it, but you can put in your domination gem. Another idea, just to throw it out there, um, you could could consider having uh, slot-specific ranks. So you have an S-tier slot, on your uh on your uh siamp and maybe at the alien siamp you have like two s tier slots but then the rest are for you know you have a an a tier and a b tier um or yeah, we... you don't even you can't even use an s tier gem until you get an alien siamp or something like that you know you could you could consider some options yeah. like that yeah, we've definitely... considered something similar okay um and we've considered... we've considered... <laughs> odd i'm just what curious is... How many gems did you get over the course of the campaign? Would you guess? Because I'm not sure we actually, I'm not sure if we actually saw. Because you usually did most of your inventory stuff off screen, so um, I think at least twenty. I think I probably had, yeah, fifteen to twenty, maybe. Um, there were some like men's Sansa was one that was like cleanse a a. a an ally from far away like i'm never going to use that um there was the blending one that i was never going to use uh that's great oh i'm sure it is i just i, I right. would much rather take a <laughs> no lens yeah. yeah um i i, I was because yeah. i was just wondering whether you know part of you getting a lot of good gems was that you just got so many gems that well, yeah. got, it ended up being inevitable. So I think the, the last point that I was going to make for this is that I do feel the research time to get a new gem or get a new PCS is a little too quick. Um, I feel yeah, like I it's too easy to just good. keep pumping out gems and PCSs behind the scenes without me having to do anything. And that uh-huh. definitely makes the the definitely makes things a bit easier for that department. Yeah, also, um, also exponentially in this version what's that sorry the research time for gems and pcs's in the version uh for this season grows exponentially uh so each time you do it the next time you do it will take longer okay Um, i didn't feel the impact of that but uh it could be because by the time we got to psionics i was in that later game phase where i wasn't taking as many missions and things were kind of progressing a lot like that's one of my criticisms of, of covert infiltration, the way it stands right now, is when you get to that end game, you're just kind of you you're just taking core missions. Like you don't need to you don't have to fight that battle anymore, right? So a lot of time can pass. Um but that's yeah, that's for another day, I think. Um guys, I think I think we've covered off a lot here. I know we've, on the screen, if you're paying attention, there's a season eight Christmas list here. Um <laughs> And I don't think yeah. we're going to have time to get into that, but um, I do think we're all on a pretty similar page in terms of what worked and what didn't, and that can give us some direction to start another campaign in uh, you know many months' time here. But um, in terms of any closing 
anything is it, I'll just maybe give everybody a chance to to say something but um if you don't have anything to add totally cool as well Deadfoot is there anything uh you want to add before we wrap it up uh there is this is, our, one, this is our one hour call by the way that is now almost three yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> really yeah. No one is surprised. Uh, plans never go through. Anyways, there is one thing that I could take off the top of my mind. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe others will cover other stuff later. Uh, but this is what I was thinking. Uh, going back to MLCX, mm -hmm. uh, the submissions versus all stars thing. Like, uh, what specifically submissions and maybe like how we mix that with all stars is like, if we were were to use MLCX again, what do you, will we still continue to use submissions or? Go back to just all, all stars. I, it's an issue. That's a good question. Um, I feel like it's nice to have user submissions, but um, I I don't want to have like user submissions mixed with randos. So I think we added those all stars because we realized, oh, we're gonna pummel through all these mox units very quickly right. if we don't add so, them. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess the question becomes: Is do we do only all stars, or do we do only submissions uh, and leave it random? Or do we do it how we did it this season with a mix of, of both? Um, I think um, I personally like the All Stars um, because it's memorable names, but I like the um, story tie-ins with the submissions. So yeah, uh, when it comes to a mod testing perspective, it was easier to use All Stars because we know those All Stars, right? Whereas like uh, right, submissions, we don't know showing those up. People. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, because who's a submission? Who's a random person? Yeah, and there were a lot of tweaks. Uh, I wish Fear was still here because he did a lot of work in figuring out some of the mox issues we had at the start of the campaign. And there was a lot of a lot of console work that was involved in like replacing soldiers behind the scenes. It was pretty cool, um, but uh, you know, we eventually got it to work, so it's fine. And now, if we use it again, it would just work. So just remembering that and i'm just like oh yeah that was this season five yeah. months ago <laughs> yeah yeah um fleet do you have anything uh j just uh, just some additional notes i guess what well, yeah one you, you said you mentioned something about uh whether you th thought research took longer this season earlier yeah and so so i looked at because i'm nuts and i keep track of this oh, um cool. looking at <laughs> looking at research finish dates for Mag oh, yeah. weapons and plated armor yeah, hit between last season and this season. So mag weapons last season, May 27th. This okay. season, June 11th. So two weeks later. Okay. Plated armor last season, June 22nd. This season, July 25th. That's so a, a whole difference. month later yeah. for plated armor. And, and two, two stats notes from Leviathan since they're interesting and they obviously didn't show up at the end can, of the episode. Before you because, go to that, can you... Uh -huh. Can you also see what force level those were done at? Uh, or no? If not, not a big deal. I just. I mean, I, I mean, I could, I could look, but it would take a little while. Okay, uh, no worries. No yeah, worries. we we just have to dig up which episodes those were. Right. Exactly. No worries. Yeah. But 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 the the two stats notes one and I I I I, I would say this is tentative because Wolfson I don't think has done his his Leviathan go through yet, right? Yeah. But uh, one, I think. Musion, our number one worst EAS of the season person, yeah. had the season best, according to my calculations, the season best individual episode EAS in Leviathan. Hell yeah. He clawed back like a third of his negative EAS in that mission alone. That's because he was hitting all those 30, 40% shotgun blasts that nobody should be hitting. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And the second one is, I think Odin broke the single mission damage record which had been held by Nils Daughter in your yep. famous oops, we forgot the VIP mission two seasons ago. <laughs> on the bridge there? I remember that. Oh, yeah, the one where wasn't on a bridge, but it was a lost mission no, where not, like you had gotten that, all the way to the EVAC zone. The VIP, and the then you're like, oh shit. Oh, the other one where I forgot them. Okay, <laughs> yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, uh, because... one, wasn't it? But uh, I believe her record is was broken by Odin. Cool. Who just pumps yes, out ridiculous numbers. Yeah, dude. Odin was my kind of dark horse of the campaign. Like, he... Uh, eventually, I wanted to take him on every mission. He was just so powerful. Like, yeah. He had damage. He had stealthiness. I could scout with him. Like, for Yellow Alert, he's literally perfect. He's the perfect class because he can shoot a bunch of stuff 
at once, and there's always a bunch of stuff, and he can eliminate one of those threats of like uh, triggering another pod accidentally, because then you get those alert markers for when you're when you're gonna trigger them. So, yeah, he was yeah, he was awesome. One of my favorites. He also had a a source of huge deep single target DPS with banish. Yeah, sure. Which I feel like I even underutilized. So he could have been even better, probably. You know exactly. Uh, good, good stuff, Fleet. That's awesome, and thanks again for all that tracking. That that adds a ton of enjoyment for me, and I hope that you continue enjoying doing it because it, it it does bring a lot to the campaign. I think. Uh, Kex, do you have anything? Yes, sir. Um, quick rapid fire. Uh, I think Mox was uh, a huge success. Definitely would bring them back. Uh, wish list. Ethereal restoration enemy mod, please. That thing will wreck you. And uh, <laughs> and something that yeah, that I makes me that really want to add it. And uh, something that I think definitely we we couldn't we can discuss in the future for whenever season eight uh, does uh, start gearing up. Yeah, uh, there's been a recent discovery debunking a terrible myth in regards of voice packs. Okay. People thought voice packs had a huge performance impact on loading times and in the overall game okay uh that's been debunked so might be something that we can talk about in terms of opening up for submissions as well yeah could be interesting um it's just closing statement thanks to nia for including me thank you for 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 keep doing this i think we're all obsessed with this game and we, <laughs> we will continue to be uh hell yeah more mods awesome stuff man thank <laughs> you uh Kalista. Yeah, um, yeah, it's been a fun, great fun season again. I love seeing you really push, you know, what the Sparks could do, even if, you know, they went a bit further than intended. Um, looking forward, I think you're going to be really impressed with some of the new mods that are coming. Uh, there's a certain one which I know I'm not allowed to talk about by Rusty and Kex which is going to be absolutely fantastic. It is on the it's list. Boring, I'm nope. I, I think I know about that one. <laughs> yeah, it, I, it's it's brilliant. and I'm I will say it's in the Christmas brilliant. list if people are looking at it, uh, but I won't point out which one. We'll leave it at that. Yeah. I did have an, a, a little idea regarding going forward, sort of the, the, the time bridge to next to if we get a season eight. Mm -hmm. I mean, Obviously, one thing I've noticed is, especially with how quick the turnaround was, the trailer to the start of the season was very quick. I mean, it was for season six. Maybe having a longer sort of build-up period before the start of the season, whether it's, I don't know, little videos highlighting mods that are going to be in the new season or something like that, just to build the hype a bit slower, give it a bit more of a slow oh, burn. I like, I like that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, back and cooking. Uh, Welcome back. back. Cooking. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, I should do that in more stuff on my channel in general. Is like, uh, you know, like little teasers and stuff. Like, I think that's that's fun. But specifically for XCOM, um, one of the things that, like, when XCOM uh, three eventually releases one day, hopefully, hopefully the mm. modding scene really buys into that as well. Um, I I would like to do more um, mod focused videos, like just highlighting a specific mod and showing kind of what it's capable of um i think stuff like that is underrepresented on youtube to, and to be fair like you, sometimes you do need additional context for mods to really show what they're capable of in a campaign but um yes i think that's a great idea and that's something i will definitely do and we'll work together on uh what those should be and how we should show those because i think it'll be fun totally i mean i'll hold my hand up and say part of what sort of triggered that triggered me thinking about that idea was the mod that I'm not allowed to talk about about rusting scanner. Yeah, so yeah. I'll hand over now. Uh, I'm only going to provide cats doesn't uh, say no. Yeah. Uh Rusty. So we're doing are we doing the quick list at the moment? No, we're uh, just doing a uh, quick round table to wrap everything up. Uh and Tara, uh, since you're here, do you want to start? Do you have anything you wanna add before we uh wrap up the episode? Ah, uh, not really. How was your dinner? Uh, no. Oh, good. Good. Uh, some white eggs and some other stuff. That sounds freaking awesome. 
Yes. Uh, other than that, maybe we could try out the Sheen mod. The witch? On the list, if we want, if we want to try it out, but that's it. Uh, which mod, sorry? Sheen. Uh, the Sheen, uh, the Sheen mod. Oh, Gene mods. Oh, like, uh, Gene alterations. Oh, Gene yeah. mods. Yeah. We can yeah. try that out. We want to next season. Yeah. Probably in the same vein of trying out augmentations. Yeah. 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 That could be cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good idea. Uh, Rusty. No, not much to say. Okay. Rusty? Um, yeah. So, uh, I don't quite know how to say this. Thank you for having me on your mod team. Oh, like, bro, are you kidding? Thank you guys. It's been an honor. Me no, bro. I, I, I... That last season. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. It, it was nice to work. It was nice to add to the, out the way. To the um, yeah. yeah, I actually I've really enjoyed this season. Uh, it's been highs and lows all over. Yeah. It's definitely been a roller coaster behind the scenes um, with uh, getting things uh, <laughs> fixed, working, running smoothly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, having some rather weird interactions crop up and be like what and why and discovering this yeah, is so the, of all this campaigns is, this is the one that literally the most uh troubleshooting has gone into ever by far I, not even I, close I, I know the kind of i designed the season seven logo as a uh, scythe odd yeah um, yeah that definitely we definitely kind of killed this uh <laughs> Something, something's dead, that's for sure, yeah. Yeah, something went, you know, something went, uh, you know, off in the code at points, and it was really good fun uh, yeah. tracking them down and trying to get them fixed. Yeah, no, and, uh, and thanks for, for all of the, the help and the, the work that you and everyone in here has done. It's been insane, and I'm, I'm honored to be able to work with you guys because it makes the whole campaign better. Like, it's, you know, in, in previous seasons, it was basically... I'm installing these mods. I'd maybe get feedback from a couple of people and boom, Bob's your uncle. Let's see what happens. Right. But now it's like, it's so big and there's so many hands involved and it, it just makes the whole thing just a better experience for the viewer. I think so. Yeah. 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 It's a lot uh, on you as, guys. As a viewer, I definitely say it's a better experience for me as a viewer side. Um, and mind blowing being behind the curtain. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, um, man. So if Kex doesn't have any uh, objection, one of the things I would like to mention. No objections, go ahead. Just checking. Uh, a mod that has currently been in development for three and a half months now uh, from uh, Kex and myself is uh, UFOpedia, which is a complete revamp of the XCOM archives, uh, including full descriptive lore, Kex has a whole team of people writing stuff out, including artwork in the archive, and it looks amazing. And then also including an entire 3D bestiary of mod of enemy units um, that you can just rotate, spin the camera around, check their abilities over, um, and nicely enough, just works with mods with no fuss from a user, just slots right that's in. sick <laughs> hey uh, bonus no, points if you could add uh your pose pack to uh enemies in the uh beast oh, oh, no. <laughs> just saying if i get a sexy muton pose like that's all i really want so that thing with feature creep that happens <laughs> <laughs> no that's gonna yeah, be really we're... that's gonna be amazing that's gonna be really really cool to have in there yeah. We're Just aiming for an early release on that uh, um, towards the end of May. Uh, okay. It might still be in a bit of a work in progress state because mm -hmm. we are heavily vetting what law and our work we sure. include. Yeah. Um, I think that mod's going to be just as big as the uh, impact as Iridar's, uh, shoot, what's it called? Uh, the character. Manager? Yeah, appearance manager yeah i think it's gonna be a mod just as big as that like things are just yeah. a mod that's just gonna change things it's right? definitely gonna be a weird one it's gonna be one of those mods that sits in the background yeah and you yeah. don't really remember it and then you spot it and you can spend i mean kex and myself 
uh, we have even just reading and vetting stuff and looking at it, we've spent hours just spinning around sector pods and firing off their wrath cannons. It's a time sink to blood. That's so cool. Well, see, having not been on development for it, but having been on the testing team for it, one thing I will say is one of my rusty kecks, one of my favorite things is the scanning to get them in the best tree in the first place. Yeah, scanning to get a unit in there as well. That's, uh, yeah. Anyway, look forward to that, guys. Yeah, very um, cool. Just a really quick, a tiny, tiny uh, plug-in because because it, it was brought up and mentioned, but uh, uh, for, for the next season, um, combat pose pack will be ready. Oh, sick. Um, oh, that'll be nice. That'll be cool. Uh, when's the mail pose pack going to be ready? Oh, Sorry. let's let's lay. Yeah, whoa, 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 and, oh, thank you, by the way, for bringing me into the group for this season. Had a great time with it. Um, just, I guess, one thing to mention that I don't think we've talked much about. Um, I think one of the big successes this season was the whole idea of making the end game challenging. I mean, maybe sometimes a little too much, but certainly I think we can agree it was challenging to an extent that we've really never seen in any previous campaign. Yeah, I would so. agree with that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, the, the thing about XCOM is you always have it. There's always power somewhere. In my opinion, it's almost never neutral. Um, but I do think in this season, throughout the course of the campaign, there was more of those tighter missions than there have been uh, previously. Some of those like, oh, like we're just on the cusp. Like this could go either way, right? Obviously, we we did succeed in the in the long run, but... I do think that we we struck that balance much better than we had um, in the past. So that's, I mean, definitely, that's a good point. Uh, you, you had a uh, near late game squad wipe uh, that yeah. I tried on. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. The <laughs> comma. <laughs> uh, I'll just I'll just wrap it up by once again saying um, thanks for all the hard work that you guys put in. This it like. This is a game that I personally have uh, developed a really amazing uh, connection with over the past six years, and I'm 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 from I'm the type of person that doesn't replay games ever. Like I don't. It's just historically never been a thing that I do. And XCOM, I I could start a new campaign tomorrow. I won't, but I could, and I would enjoy it playing it every day. Um, and that's Can't because see the viewer. what's that? Can't, cannot see the tape of the viewer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they need a break. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but I'm just saying that you guys basically put a lot of longevity into it, and for me, that's what's really outstanding because you're doing it because you also enjoy the game, presumably as much as as somebody like me. So uh, when, when, it, when... it means a lot that you're willing to put in so much personal time to not only developing the mods, but then also being part of the team that works with me to make these experiences for the viewer as good as possible. And um, I think one thing that I, I don't talk about enough is that you guys don't really pull any punches either with me. Um, and I appreciate that you'll give me like honest feedback about stuff, even if you are a bit worried that I might take it a certain way or something. Um, you guys are, are super honest and I think that's a really cool quality. So. Um, yeah, let's wrap it up here. Uh, we're going to be slightly, we're going to be around three hours. If you guys made it this far in the comments, uh, you need to type what? What should they type? Let me ask one of you for a specific code word. Uh, Kex, just, what's just, the code I word? Gonna, I was going to say something else. Shorts. Shorts. Shorts? <laughs> nope. The code <laughs> word. The code word, if you made it this far, will be Wang Fu Destruction. <laughs> See? Perfect. Perfect. That's Absolutely a perfect. great code word. Yeah. I Spelled correctly, of course. Idea, but it's a great idea. Yeah. 
All right, everybody. Thank you so much for watching and or and or listening. I uh, hope you enjoyed this. If you guys have any feedback on uh, whether you'd like to hear this again after every season, or uh, if you have ideas on uh, what you want us to talk about in uh, future iterations, then for sure, let us know. And we will take that under advisement. Have a good one, everybody. Bye for now. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.